Have you seen the new documentary about O.J. Simpson, uh, the ESPN documentary? It's, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's amazing. It's not only about O.J. Simpson, but it's also about American culture and how, you know what it was like in the 60s and 70s and 80s regarding uh, black-white relations and politics. And it just involves so many different things, the law and it comes on the heels of an, uh, you know, a pretty good miniseries on FX about the O.J. Simpson trial. I forget what it was called, American Crime Story or something. I thought it was a little cheesy at times, but I thought it was also quite gripping. You have to take it with a grain of salt, this recreation, the miniseries on FX, because, of course, the writers are interpreting things and taking things out and that kind of stuff. But... It, from what I understand, it seemed like a fairly accurate picture of, of what uh, might have happened during, during the trial. So after watching these two incredible uh, TV experiences, <laughs> for lack of a better term, I have just been obsessed with the O.J. Simpson case. I it was alive and an, an adult in the 90s and experienced the whole O.J. Simpson thing uh, as, a, as an American, but I didn't follow it. it. It was something that I heard about and people, I could, you know, I heard people talking about it, but I never really looked into it. So this is really the first time I've, I've ever learned the, the details about it, and I just, I just find it fascinating. Plus, uh, I've received uh, a lot of emails from patrons asking me to do an episode about OJ because of these two miniseries documentaries that, 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 that have come out. So, so here we are, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to dive deep into the topic. I'm going to talk about some of the history, and I'm going to talk about possible psychological factors behind the behaviors exhibited by O.J. Simpson. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle, and I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. Before I go any further, I have to say that all of my facts are from the internet, and I'm sure I'm going to get some of the facts wrong. And if you feel like emailing me a, a correction, feel free to do so. But understand that I understand that some of my facts are, are perhaps in error. The point of this podcast is not to provide you with a precise documentation of the facts. The purpose of this podcast is to have a discussion regarding the psychological factors that are possible in O.J. Simpson's life. And if I get one or two details wrong, it probably isn't going to throw off that discussion very much. But, you know, if you have a correction, feel free to send it. But again, the point of this podcast is not to provide you with the uh, precise details of, of his life. The other thing I'll say is that as I talk about O.J. Simpson, you know, he's, he's a real person. He's a real man that is alive in America. And I have to say that I could be completely wrong about everything. And I understand that the internet and the, and the media might only be giving me a certain picture of him. And as, a, as a, an evaluator of actual patients, I can tell you that it is very difficult to evaluate people and assess people from afar. You really have to interview them personally. You have to talk to their loved ones and their associates personally. You have to test them and uh, you know compare them to to norms. And all of this I have not done, obviously, with O.J. Simpson. So everything that I'm about to say could be... Uh, well, it should be taken with a grain of salt based on on that fact. And, and just a little tip to everyone out there in, in podcast land, whenever you hear anybody in the media evaluating someone that they haven't talked to personally, you should always take what they say with a grain of salt, a massive grain of salt, 
because it, it, you know, for instance, currently in the media, there's a lot of talk about analyzing Donald Trump, and you you know you can you can speculate and you can throw things out there, but uh, professionals out there really should be having a massive disclaimer, such as the one I'm saying right now, because. You just don't really know what, especially a famous person, because they the, the famous person like O.J. Simpson knows that they're famous. And when they present themselves in front of cameras or in interviews or whatever, they are presenting a, a part of themselves. Uh, imagine yourself being interviewed on TV. You're not going to just relax and chill like you're in your living room. You're going to present a certain side of yourself. You know, you're not going to fart, for instance, <laughs> or swear or say that questionable racist joke. You're you're going to present a side of yourself that you want other people to see. And famous people are no different. And so. We really just have to take all of this with a grain of salt. I want to talk about the purpose of this podcast because I don't want it to come across like I'm just making something f- to talk about murder and about famous people. The The purpose of this podcast is to educate people about domestic violence and intimate partner violence or IPV. It's also uh, the purpose of this podcast is to educate about race in America. It's a complicated topic, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I, I think it's, you know, and I'm not the first to say this, obviously, the story of O.J. Simpson is a, is a story about race in America. It's very interesting. Also, another purpose of this podcast is to just educate about general psychology there's a lot of crap on the internet, and I consider it my duty, so to speak, to provide at least one voice from an actual professional, and so that is what I'm attempting to do. So I'll just tell you about my own personal experience with O.J. Simpson. I was born in 1970, so I, I remember him. I definitely remember him. I don't remember him for his SC days, but I, I definitely remember him as a famous person on the TV. <laughs> um, his NFL fame was mostly over by the time I was old enough to know who he was, but I do remember the Hertz commercials. Uh, it's hard to imagine if you're a millennial out there, but if you're my age or older, you, you remember how iconic some commercials were, you know, where's the beef, this kind of thing. That We only watched a few channels back then, and there weren't that many commercials. It's a strange thing to think about, you know. Today we have hundreds, thousands of channels, uh, and we can easily, ba- I mean, I could, okay, <laughs> let me just talk about the times. In the 70s, we had a TV and we didn't even have a remote control. So, whatever you were watching, you just left it on that channel, right? You just sat through the commercials. And the commercials, to some extent, were even part of the entertainment. And so, when you had a commercial that was actually well produced, like the OJ Simpson Hertz commercials, because, you know, a lot of commercials are really bad, but the OJ Simpson Hertz commercials were actually produced. They were well thought out and, you know, the camera angle was, you know, thought about. And those commercials were, were entertaining. People, people loved those commercials. And OJ Simpson just came across like this, this really likable guy. He, you know, was jumping over things and he's in the airport and, you know, he just seemed like a, an important person and everyone loved him. Run, OJ, run, or go, juice, go, and all this stuff. So if you are of my generation or older, you remember OJ Simpson. You remember how important he was in America at the time. And that's something you really get from the documentary. If, if you're younger than me, you, you might think, oh, wasn't, you know, why was the, why was the country obsessed with OJ? He was, he was, he was like Michael Jackson or he was like Michael Jordan. 
uh, or he's probably bigger than Michael Jordan. I mean, Michael Jordan was huge, but, and of course he was in commercials and, and movies and this sort of thing. But, but I don't know, OJ Simpson just had a whole thing around him and he was so charismatic on, on the TV, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, a great athlete, but not the most charismatic guy on, on television. OJ just had this, had this way about him on TV that especially, during those early days that, that just really uh, was appealing. I, I also rem- remember him from The Naked Gun, which a lot of people <laughs> will remember him from. But again, in the, in the documentary, you get a bigger picture of, of his fame in, in college, in, in the USC, the Heisman Trophy, playing for Buffalo, and, and all this sort of stuff. But anyway, I remember he had a really clean image he, he was seen as a really nice dude, you know, he was very clean cut. And this is a time in the 70s when there were a lot of groups of African Americans, uh, black people in America who were really trying to redra- reject the clean cut Uncle Tom aspects of being a black person. And so OJ in America was someone that all the white people could uh, could attach themselves to. And he was very appealing in that way. Then fast forward to the 90s in, the, in June of 1994, I remember coming home from work or something and I walk in my house and I was, it was just right after college. So I was still living with a bunch of dudes in a crappy house that was disgusting with hand-me-down furniture and no one cleaned the kitchen or the bathrooms and it was disgusting and uh, I actually just get creeped out thinking back on it. I was fine with it at the time, but anyway, it was June of 1994. I remember coming home from work or something. I walk in the door and my roommates were watching this car chase on our little 13-inch color TV. I was 23 at the time. I didn't really care about the news uh, that much back then, so I didn't really care about this this car chase. But I remember some of my friends really caring about it, and they watched the car chase the entire you know as it as it unfolded. And I would occasionally go up to the living room and go, "Is it still on TV? Like, why are you guys watching this?" And then I remember the trial. And again, my friends would watch this trial and they would talk about it, but I just didn't really care. And I didn't watch a lot of TV back then. And I don't know, I just don't really remember paying that much attention to it. But I actually, I do remember Judge Ito. And I remember thinking, yay, a Japanese American judge. That's pretty cool. You know, a Japanese American brother rises to fame, but then I also remember people hacking on him a lot and thinking, oh, come on, Ito, like, pull it together. Represent. Um, I also remember the polls, and I remember really being shocked about the polls. I remember you know, two-thirds of white Americans think that he's guilty, and two-thirds of black Americans believe that he's innocent. And that was very shocking to me. I remember being quite shocked by that, that the same evidence presented to two different groups of people could be interpreted so differently. And I didn't know what to make of that. Again, I didn't follow the trial or anything, and so I didn't have an opinion about whether or not he was guilty or innocent. So, uh, And actually, uh, upon watching the documentary or reading somewhere or something, that that difference, that two-thirds, two-thirds, was actually at the beginning of the trial. So at the beginning of the trial, before, before the trial even began, before the evidence was brought forward, two-thirds of white Americans believed he was guilty, and two-thirds of black Americans thought he was, he was innocent. And after the trial, after all the evidence comes out and all the pundits talking about it and all the rhetoric, it, the, the difference between white and black Americans actually became more severe. So after the, after the trial, three-fourths of white people believed he was guilty and three-fourths of black people thought he was innocent, which is really interesting when you think about it, right? That 
after after the evidence is presented, you would think that there would be less of a difference because it wouldn't be so much about race anymore, right? But it but it became even more bifurcated based on race. That if you were a black person <clears throat> and you were on the fence at the beginning of the trial, by the end of the trial, you're like, oh, for sure, he's innocent. And if you're a white person and you're on the fence and you're thinking, well, yeah, I don't really know. Maybe he's innocent. Maybe he's guilty. By the end of the trial, you're you're sure that he's guilty. It's just a bizarre thing when you think about it, and a, a very interesting sociological phenomenon in, in that we see things through a lens, right? We see things and we experience our reality through race in, in no matter where you live, no matter what country or society you live in, you, you experience things culturally. And this is just a stark example of that. And I remember a lot of white people around me would say, oh, those stupid black people, they're just biased and they can't see the truth. And I didn't know what to make of it back then, but uh, I, I remember that. And I think that uh, 20 some odd years later, it's interesting to look back on. And I'll, I'll talk m more on that uh, later. Okay, so let's get into O.J. Simpson's life. I haven't read any of his books or anything, so I just have a little bit of information. And again, I could have some of this wrong, but just some of the broad strokes. And this is particularly from the documentary because they interview his childhood friends and they talk about what he was like as a kid. And so I think that it's pretty interesting. But an interesting thing that I learned from the documentary and from reading up about O.J. Simpson's childhood was that his father was not around very often, and O.J. resented this. There were interviews with O.J. and O.J. saying that he was hurt and, and really angry about his father not being around and giving him guidance, and he said his father was uh, particularly um, impactful in his decision as a, as a teenager to become a part of a gang, which I'll get into more in a second, but but so, so that's a very notable thing and something that is important psychologically. When you have a parent that's, who, who's not around, children will undoubtedly have an attachment injury. They will develop a wound regarding attachment, and that will play itself out later in life, which I'll also get into later. Also, interesting to note that the father was gay. And this is something that I didn't know about either. And not that it's uh, an obvious factor in any of OJ's personality, but you could see how it might, given society's oppression and hatred of gay people, particularly back then in the, in the 50s and 60s, you could see how that would likely play a role in OJ's life, although it's not easily... Uh, you know, determined on, on regarding that. So uh, OJ had had three siblings, and you can imagine, and and they also lived in in the projects in a very poor part of town in San Francisco. And you can imagine this this mother being very stressed out. She's probably living paycheck to paycheck. She is raising four children in a difficult neighborhood. She's African-American. This is, you know, and this is the 50s and 60s. This is not a stress-free environment, you know what I'm saying? So uh, you can imagine that the mom would be quite stressed and also not have a lot of time for all of her children. And so we can also imagine that although OJ talked about his mother very positively, we can also imagine that the mother did not have enough time to pay sufficient attention to all of her children. This is speculation, of course. I have no idea. I don't have any data on that. OJ never said anything along these lines. But in my experience, and according to research, when you have multiple stressors on a family, and it's particularly a single parent family, you are going to find that attachment is going to be strained. And this is something that I'll get into more later. 
also, which uh, another interesting revelation that I learned, not from the documentary, I don't think, but in reading, he, OJ, had rickets as a young child. And if you're not famil- familiar with r- rickets, it's usually due to a, a prolonged and extreme vitamin D deficiency. And it results in a softening and weakening of the bones. And this is perhaps due to malnutrition and maybe parental neglect, hard to say, but uh, just something to think about there. And because he had rickets when he was, uh, you know, two, three, four, or five years old, he had to wear braces on his legs in order to correct for his 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 bones in his legs and it's interesting because when you watch him run when he was in college and in the nfl he kind of has this sort of bow-legged way of running i've always noticed that he always had this and it, it in a way almost sort of added to his grace and it wasn't pronounced bow-legged but just a just a little bit bow-legged and i think i don't know i it it seems like it might have uh, had its origins in this childhood rickets and you can imagine being a child living uh, in the 50s and 60s you know this is before the internet before video games before even really tv was was that uh, robust and they might not have even had a tv in their house and so when you're a kid, all you do is play outside. That's that's all you can do, uh, aside from reading books, I suppose. And you can imagine being four years old, five years old, and everyone's outside playing, and and you have to wear this this iron brace to correct for your for your bones. You can imagine that this would be a really affecting experience for a young child of any generation, really, but. You can imagine that it, that it would, and, and it's just interesting that O.J. later became the most, you know, graceful, most powerful, fastest runner around, <laughs> and it's just something to think about, right? This this success story, and perhaps what c- contributed to his personality, what might have given him a, a complex regarding his legs, or a complex regarding mobility or a complex regarding being accepted as as good enough to play with the other kids you can imagine that that would be part of his personality given that he went through that at a very very early age his parents separated when he was five again he had three siblings at the age of 13 or somewhere in his teen years he reportedly joined a street gang called the Persian Warriors. The Persian Warriors. Interesting name, given that they weren't actually Persian, I'm guessing. But um, during his stint in a gang, he convicted some sort of minor crime and was in jail for a bit. So again, kind of a notable thing. Now, African-American kids in the projects were, you know, disaffected and, and depressed and sometimes the only way to establish some sort of security in your neighborhood was to uh, commit some crimes like, you know, establishing your power in in contrast to a, another local gang or groups of white kids might have uh, threatened them or something. But uh, so it's not uncommon for a young black kid to, to go to jail. But again, it is interesting that you have this this early experience of prison and this early experience with crime. So just another notable thing in OJ's development. So from the documentary, uh, the interviews with his childhood friends, they provide a lot of stories about what OJ was like as a kid. And some notable early personality traits are are worth considering for instance he appeared to be glib is what they call it in the psychological terminology he seemed to be able to get people to like him in perhaps a fake and manipulative way for example one of his friends talks about a story when they got in trouble at school 
And he easily, through his manipulative behavior and through his ability to charm people, he got out of trouble very easily with his friends and with authority. From an early age, it was clear that he was able to charm people and to get his way. Now, it's not extreme. If, if he hadn't murdered anyone later in life, then you would just say, well, you know, he's a charming guy. He was, he was a likable, charming guy. So it wasn't extreme, but it is notable that early in life, he was able to use his charm to get out of trouble. Another uh, personality trait that seemed to be present is what we call psychopath, psychopathic deviance. Uh, not full-blown psychopathy, but just the he, he's on the above average on the spectrum of the uh, ability to break rules or the uh, lack of respect for authority. He wasn't extreme, but it was... It was there. He, he just didn't really care that much about the rules. Again, not extreme. There were, there are definitely uh, higher, you know, people, there are p- people, hi- you know, on the spectrum higher than OJ exhibited, but just something to think about that. He wasn't a rule follower. Let's just put it that way. Another notable personality trait that his friends talked about in the documentary was he seemed a little narcissistic. Narcissistic. He, early in his life, said that he was going to be the greatest football player of all time. And this is, you know, perhaps a little narcissistic. But, you know, a lot of kids say this. A lot of kids in high school say this. So it's not that unusual to hear. But it is notable to... to, to Uh, to our later discussion regarding his personality. Okay, so let's skip forward to when he's an adult. Aside from his success in football and media and this sort of stuff, let's look at some of his just personal life. He apparently reportedly cheated on both of his wives. So in case you don't know, he he, he, he was married early, I think in college, and to an African-American woman, and I think a childhood friend of his, if I'm not mistaken. And he cheated on her a lot, apparently. And he even, to some extent, would flaunt his mistresses in front of his both of his wives, because he later divorced and married Nicole. So, regarding Nicole, he, in 1977, he met... Uh, Nicole Brown, and at the time, he was 30 years old, and she was only 18 years old. She was working as a waitress in a nightclub. It kind of sounds like that 80s song. I was working as a waitress in a nightclub, and you are O.J. Simpson. Anyway, um, so O.J. Simpson was 12 years older than Nicole, and again, notable to for our d- later revelations and discussions of his personality. He's 30 years old. He's famous as heck. He's rich. And he meets this 18-year-old uh, waitress. And and he says uh, to his friend, as soon as he sees Nicole, and, you know, he's, you know imagine he's at this club and he sees this this beautiful waitress, very young waitress in the club, and, and OJ turns to his friend and says, I'm going to marry that girl. In one respect, that's a very romantic thing, right? I'm sure at their wedding, that story was a, might have been told, and it was, you know, it, when he was love at first sight. But in another way, this is also potentially a a very sexist and narcissistic statement, right? You are looking at a woman from across the room and you just assume that you're going to be able to marry her. Now, was it a romantic gesture? Like, man, I just got to meet that woman and find out what's going on. And because she's just so beautiful, that's, that's one thing, right? But then another thing is, 
I'm OJ Simpson. I'm the juice and I'm going to get that girl. And there's just, you know, that's just the way that it is because I'm OJ Simpson. And, and this woman is so beautiful that wouldn't she be a great trophy on my side? So hard to know where OJ is coming from in that moment. But again, given the later story elements here, it seems to potentially be in the realm of the, the more evil side of things, but we'll see. So uh, it should be noted that OJ met Nicole and started dating her when he was still married to his first wife, Marguerite. Uh, it's also talked about in the documentary, and this is all just people talking, so hard to know about the veracity, but uh, Nicole's friend said that when Nicole came back after her first date with OJ, she had, uh, her pants were torn and her friend asked her, what's, what happened with OJ Simpson? Why are your pants torn? And Nicole said that OJ had been sexually forceful with her in some way. And her friend said, I don't think you should be dating him. And Nicole said, oh, no, no, you know, I, I really like him. I, I'm going to, I'm going to give this a try anyway. Again, it's unknown as to the truthfulness of, of this, but it would be consistent with the overall story. And just a tragic you know, element to the story, right? That on their very first date, he w- was so abusive with her that he ripped her, her jeans, her pants, Imagine, I mean, you know, date rape is one thing, but imagine being uh, date raped to the point where your clothes are are damaged. I mean, I just can't imagine what what would have happened in that situation, you know. And so, uh, some some things to think about here is that uh, abusers will often test the waters and see who is receptive to their abusive tactics. They'll start off small and sort of ramp up to more severe behaviors. And in this way, apparently, Nicole passed the test on their first date in that she, quote unquote, allowed it to happen and didn't reject him for the second date. So... Just something to think about there. But again, she's 18. She is dating a very famous person. The awareness of of intimate partner violence or domestic violence back then was much lesser than it is today. Today, it still is not at the awareness level that it should be, but it was even less known in, in 1977. So hard to know what Nicole would have done if she were older, if she had better support, if our society was different regarding this sort of thing, if sexism wasn't quite as pronounced uh, as it was back then. But anyway, that's a a tragic beginning to uh, an ominous beginning to the relationship between OJ and Nicole Brown. So then two years later, Simpson and Marguerite divorced. OJ was 31, Nicole was 19, and later they got married, uh, OJ and, and Nicole. Now, there in the documentary, it, it is depicted, I think, quite effectively. The, the, the long several years of domestic violence between OJ and Nicole. They have 911 phone call recordings. They have police reports. They have pictures of her, of her beaten face. They have, I think her journal articles they have, or her journal entries. They have, or letters to her friends or something. They have just all these accounts, and it's just classic domestic violence. It's just classic, and it's terrible, and it's severe. And where you know, considering where it ends up, you just 
you think, my God, why didn't someone do something about this? <laughs> it was written on the wall that something was going to happen, right? OJ was extremely jealous. While, while they were married, he wouldn't let her out of his sight. He wouldn't let her do things. If she just talked to a man uh, at, you know, say there, there were stories of, I can't remember the exact details, but she was uh, seen on TV talking to a guy or something and not, God, I can't remember the exact details, but it was, it was like, she just talked to like a waiter or something, you know, it was that innocuous. It was like, if, if you're at a restaurant and your waiter is a man, then you as a woman are going to talk to him because you're going to order something. It was something as innocuous as that. And OJ flipped out. He was jealous and angry and became quite controlling. He would hire people to watch her. This is a, a classic domestic violence perpetrator uh, behavior. You know, he had enough money to hire private investigators to, to watch her. After uh, they separated, because Nicole finally had had enough, he spied on her while she was having sex with someone that she was dating. He then broke into the house and into her house and confronted them the next day and confronted the guy and... Uh, I mean, just just imagine that 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 you you get divorced and you're sad, and you go to your ex's house and w you find through the window that your ex is is on a date and oh boy now they're having sex and you just watch them and then the next day you barge into your ex's house and confront them as if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. He would often blame her for things. And there's a narcissistic bent to all this, but that I'll get into more later. But he had been arrested a number of times. I don't know how many times, but, but the cops were called to the house many times. And he had been arrested at least once, if not more than once. And he just kept doing it. He just kept on doing it. And it, it's just, just heartbreaking to, to see in the, in the documentary of just how obvious, or I don't know, you know, it's, it wasn't, I'm sure it's not obvious, but it, when you, you know, know the future of what's about to happen, you just think, my God, why didn't someone do something? Why didn't the, the cops do something? Why didn't someone uh, step in and try to help OJ or something? And it's just, it's a tragedy. So uh, the documentary lays it all out, and I highly recommend watching the ESPN documentary. But, but anyway, we fast forward to 1994 when the murders occurred, and Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman were murdered. Uh, on Nicole's front steps to her house and while her kids were still inside sleeping. And apparently she had been out at a restaurant and had left her glasses behind. And Ronald Goldman was a waiter there. And he was an, an aspiring actor, I think, or a model. And he was, uh, the, the manager gave the glasses to Ronald Goldman said, Oh, drive these out to Nicole's house. And so Goldman drove out to her house. And while they were at the front gate and he, Goldman was giving Nicole the glasses, you know, someone jumped out of the bushes and, and murdered the two of them in this extremely brutal fashion. Now there uh, is a lot of speculation as to exactly how the murders occurred. And I, if you can stand it, I, I recommend looking up some of this information because it's actually, I think, important to know, given if you believe O.J. Simpson did it, and just cutting to the chase, I believe that he did it. And most experts are, you know, 100% sure that he did it. And I'll get into more of that later. But when you consider the the details of this murder, you 
you you begin to see OJ in this in this very different light. It uh, there are two scenarios. One is is that I've seen. One is is that OJ jumped out as they were together. You know, G- Goldman arrives and they're talking, and then OJ jumps out, hits Nicole on the head with a bat, and then um, maybe stabs her once, and then goes to Goldman and and kills him, and then goes back to Nicole and finishes her off. The other scenario is that he saw Nicole coming out of the condo, jumped her, killed her, and then Goldman walked up just randomly right then. And uh, then, then, and Goldman was, and it was dark, and so it was night. And so Goldman says, what's going on here? And then OJ jumps and kills Goldman and then turns back to um, the both of them and, you know, brutally basically cuts their heads off almost to some extent. So, um, and just a warning uh, on this podcast, but also on the documentary, the ESPN documentary, they show graphic photographs and they don't warn you before it happens. And there's a few moments where they they do it. They don't just do it in one point. And I actually recommend, unless you're someone that you know you can handle that kind of stuff, I recommend actually not watching those those scenes. And I, I really wish that the show would have... The ESPN show would have said something like um, warning, picture alert, or something. I, th- I think it's, and there's some writing on this that it's it's important to show those photos because we need to remember what happened to these people. That it wasn't just, uh, you know, it wasn't just a murder. It was a brutal a brutalization of two human beings. And when you see the pictures, you see that. But I actually put my hands up over the screen and didn't look at those photos because I'm the sort of person that if I see something like that, it'll haunt me. It's it's traumatic. It's not good for my brain to see that kind of stuff. It's it's not healthy for me to look at. And so I, I be and I had heard about it before. So someone had alerted me to it. And so as I thought as I go, like, oh, I bet you they're gonna show you show me those photos now. And so I put my hands over the screen. And so just a little warning about that. But anyway, when you watch the documentary, and to some extent when you, when you watch the miniseries on FX, you clearly can tell that OJ committed these murders. I mean, it is just, it's, it's clear, particularly given the later things that happened in OJ after, after this, the, the initial trial in 94, you know, it, there, there's just so much evidence. And in the documentary, they interview the prosecutor. Uh, I can't remember her name, but she's a famous person. But um, they interview her, and she's saying that she had never seen a, a murder case with that much evidence. And I believe it, because the way that O.J. killed these people, allegedly killed these people, it is it was so brutal and so ill planned and and so impulsive maybe that there was no way that there there was just too there were too many things that were happening that he didn't plan for and didn't account for afterwards that it he just led a literal trail of blood and so for instance the, there was he 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 had a, he had these expensive gloves that were very, they were, they were kind of rare. They were like, you know, special rich people, black gloves. And so not a lot of people would have those gloves. And they even had a receipt from Nicole. Nicole, I think Nicole ironically bought him those gloves. And so one of the gloves was at the scene and the other glove was at OJ Simpson's house. <laughs> okay. And both gloves had, I think, the blood of Nicole, the blood of Ronald Goldman, and the blood of O.J. Simpson. So just right there, you have two gloves, one at the scene, one at O.J.'s house, all all three people's blood, because O.J. cut his hand pretty severely in the attacks uh, somehow. And so so right there, okay, there, there was blood um, on his shoes that he 
that he, you, there were bloody footprints at the scene. And again, OJ had these very expensive, rich people shoes that only a, you know, a small number of people owned. And there were pictures of him wearing these shoes and the footprint was very distinct to this, to this kind of shoe. Then you have the fact that the blood of all three people are in his Bronco and the blood of all three people are at his house in his socks and all this other kind of stuff. You have the fact that OJ had no alibi. He, there was, there was no story of like, Oh, he was at this restaurant and these people saw him or, Oh, he was hanging out with this person and this person saw him during the time of the murders. No, there was no alibi. He had no alibi. There was nothing that he could say. He's just like, I don't know. I was hanging out at home or something. I can't remember what he said, but there were fibers and hairs at, at, you know, the location of, of the murder in the Bronco and at, in OJ's house, you just have this, this literal trail of blood and fibers and hair that goes from the, of all three people that goes from the murder scene to the Bronco and to his home because he didn't plan this out or he, he had a very bad plan for it. And so he just, he committed this awful murder and then did it in this very bloody fashion. Frankly, he, he just, he, it's like he wanted, I don't know, as much blood as possible. And then he just trounced through the blood and he, uh, Oh, there was a hat that had his hairs in it at the scene or something. Anyway. So there was just, tons and tons of evidence. And he also had a tremendous motive. There was a long documented buildup of violence from him to Nicole and a long documented buildup of jealousy and violation of her rights and breaking into her house and making threats and her even saying to people, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. She said this to multiple people. And so it's just undeniable, you know, unless you believe that the cops planted it all, which, you know, you'd have to, I don't, it would, you would have to be very good at planting evidence and you would, you would have to be very good about keeping secrets and you'd have to be very, I don't know. It just, there's just no way that that many cops were that good about it. And so, uh, so there you go. Now, what I will say is that in the documentary, you clearly see, and I'll maybe get into more of this later, why the mostly black jury uh, acquitted O.J. Simpson. It's important to note that they didn't say he was not, they didn't say he was innocent. There's a difference between not guilty and innocent. A lot of people will say, oh, he was, he was proven innocent. No, in American courts, you're not proven innocent. You're, you're proven not guilty, which is different than innocent. It means we can't prove that this person is guilty of this crime. We don't, maybe this person did commit this crime, but there's not enough, the prosecution, it hasn't presented enough evidence for me to be uh, you know, highly convinced, I can't remember the exact legal, beyond a preponderance of the, no, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, I think is the thing. It's a very high threshold. And the jury was like, look, the the defense poked a lot of holes in the evidence. And, and you know, OJ put on those gloves, they didn't fit. And so there's, there's a, and, and, well, anyway, I'll get more of that later. But so the other thing that really points to his guilt is immediately after the murders, he's clearly suicidal. When you watch the FX miniseries, and the, it really depicts it well, and the, the documentary doesn't really depict it very well, but the FX miniseries really does. And when you look at his, his notes that he wrote just before he got in the Bronco and was you know trying to get away, you you just clearly see how how he believed his life was over you know in my estimation he he committed this very impulsive act and did not think about it that much beforehand or at least you know 
not sufficiently anyway, or without the thought of how can I get away with this? I don't think he thought at all, how am I going to get away with this? I thought, I think he, all he thought was I'm going to kill her. And, and then he did. And then right afterwards, he's thinking, Oh my God, my life is over. I, there's all this blood everywhere. I'm, I'm caught red handed literally. And I'm not going to get out of this. And so he writes this note and it's pretty clear. It's a suicide note. He's, you know, he's saying, please remember the good OJ, you know, I love my family and, <clears throat> and all this stuff. And he was threatening to kill himself too, as they were in the Bronco, you know, with the helicopters overhead and the cops chasing, he's telling everyone, look, I'm going to kill myself. He had the, he had a gun to his head. His friend who was driving the Bronco is saying, you know, on the, they had a phone and they're talking to the cops and this friend is saying, do not come close to this car because OJ is going to kill himself. And this is terrifying and I don't want him to die. And the police chief gets on the phone and, and is talk. I don't know if it's the chief, but some, some, you know, police person gets on the phone and is talking to OJ and is talking him down just saying, don't, don't kill yourself. Don't do it. If, if he didn't kill Nicole and Ronald Goldman, why would he be that suicidal? right? He uh, would, you know, let's say, let's just, for instance, let's just say he didn't commit the murders. Well, and this is very early. This is before the evidence comes out. This is just, you know, very early on. I don't know, maybe just a few days after the deaths. I'm not quite sure about that. But anyway, um, just imagine that, that, that you, you have a contentious divorce and your, your ex is brutally murdered. Well, you would be grieving and you'd be very sad and tra traumatized, but you wouldn't just suddenly become suicidal and just say, that's it. My life is over. Um, I mean, I could, I guess I could see it happening to some extent for some people, but, but anyway, it's, when you look at the picture, you, you just, you just can clearly tell that OJ thought he was going to become convicted of this and he was overwhelmed with that reality and he just and he thought there's no way out of this and so i'm just going to kill myself but my estimation is that he chickened out as most people would you know it's it's hard to kill yourself i i would know but i i have i have a lot of you know suicidal clients and have talked with a lot of people who have contemplated suicide for years and it's, it's a scary thing. I mean, imagine trying to kill yourself. It's, it's scary. Even if you're a hundred percent on board with the premise that you don't want to live anymore, it's, it's a very hard decision to make because it's scary. There's, there's a, we, we all have a, a mechanism in our brain that says, you know, survival. And so it's hard to overcome that and, and kill yourself. And so I, I think that he, he chickened out. And I think that he was actually considering killing himself right up until the last moment when he handed himself over to the police. I think that he was, he was thinking about um, doing it seriously uh, up at, right up until that, that last moment. I think he said in the note or on the phone, he, he said that he deserves to be hurt. He deserves to be hurt. He said, I deserve to be hurt. So just think about that. Why would you say that if you were innocent? And again, I'm not saying anything new. You, you talk to any of the experts and, and people who are close and people who don't have a reason to hate OJ. And they all say, when you look at the big picture, it's clear that he killed uh, Nicole and, and Ronald Goldman. Okay. So as we all know, he became acquitted of, of that. Um, during the trial and uh, the mini series is fascinating in this way because it's mostly about the the trial and if not the entire thing is about the trial and it's it's just a fascinating story the trial it, it's very complicated and there's so many things that went on during that trial the jury selection where they had the um, the trial itself because they had it downtown which is more black people as opposed to somewhere else. It was on the heels of the Rodney King situation where you had 
four cops, I think, four or five cops who were acquitted of any kind of crime, even though it was clear that they were committing a crime when they beat, um, when they beat Rodney King. There was another case that they talk about in the documentary in which this, this teenage black girl was in this convenience store and she got into a verbal argument with the, I think a Korean uh, shop owner and the, as and they're just verbally uh, arguing and you, cause they have, they have it on security camera footage and this sub, I think she's 17. She, this, this black girl, she, she's arguing and you know, they're upset. And then the black girl turns around to walk out of the store and the woman working at the, at the counter just shoots her in the back of the head. And this is all on camera and, and kills her. And the, there's a trial, and I believe the woman was acquitted of any kind of wrongdoing, that it was like, well, uh, you know, it was self-defense or something. And this is obviously an outrage to the black community in L.A. And so all these things are happening right before the O.J. Simpson trial. And, and again, the way that that it was uh, defended the way that Johnny Cochran defended OJ, it, it, it all becomes very clear as to why the jury acquitted OJ of, of the crimes. Right after the trial, right after the jury acquitted OJ, and, and even today, you'll hear people talk about the jury as a bunch of idiots, as a bunch of biased idiots who acquitted OJ. And if, if you look at the situation very simply, very briefly, and without an understanding of race in America, then that is a very easy conclusion to come to. Because again, you just had this mountain of evidence and this defense team who were desperately just trying to do whatever they could to, to uh, eliminate the evidence and did it in this very dubious way it's just like how could you and they only debated the issue for like a morning uh, you know the usually they say this in the documentary i think that for for every week of the trial there's there's a day of deliber- of deliberation or something like this so they they expect and the and the trial was something like a year long or something so they expected deliberation to be at least for a couple of weeks, if not for several weeks, where the where the jury sits around and talks about it and goes over the evidence and blah blah blah. But what what ended up ha- and and it's important to note that jury members are not supposed to talk with each other during the trial. So the very first time, I mean, they can talk, but they can't talk about the trial. So the very first time that they're able to talk amongst themselves, these, these 12 people, the very first time that they're able to talk amongst themselves about the trial, they only talked about it for, I think, just a few hours. This is a trial that lasted, again, something like a year long. Tons and tons of evidence and tons and tons of testimony and blah, blah, blah. And they, it only took them a few hours. And then and they were just like, yep, he's, he's innocent. I don't have I don't have anything to talk about. There's nothing to discuss. It's so obvious that he's not guilty. And it was quite shocking. And so when you look at all this stuff, you you think, man, what a bunch of idiots. Who are, who are these people? But in the documentary particularly you see that there was a history building up to that moment. There was a cultural context in which that trial existed. Many black people in L.A. had seen cops frame their family members. The, there are many people. Just think about this, okay? Now, if, if you're from a, from a community that this doesn't happen to, it might be hard to imagine. But imagine being in a community where everyone is positive that the cops are generally against your people and that the cops will do anything to convict you and that the cops will... Uh, frame you will 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 plant evidence to get you like they might want to charge you with cocaine possession so 
they pull a baggie of cocaine out of their glove box in the cop car and put it in your car and boom, you now are a drug dealer and you're going to jail for five years. This, this happened all the time. I think Mark Furman even talked about this. Mark Furman being an LA police officer, the one who found the bloody glove at OJ's house there. He was talking to a, a screenwriter or a book writer or something. And they have all these tapes of him talking, just talking very, very candidly about what it's like to be a cop. Cause this writer was going to write this story about cops. And she's like, okay, cop Mark Furman, tell me about what, what's it like on the streets? What's it like? And Mark Furman is saying, oh yeah, he's, you know, he's using the N word a lot. And he's saying, you know, people are, uh, you know, black people are da 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 and Mexicans are blah, blah, blah. And, and I think I'm pretty sure he even talked about how they would frame people for things. And so it's, it's well documented. It happened. Cops would frame black people for crimes. So when the defense brings up this notion that maybe the cops were framing OJ Simpson, then that throws everything into question. And then you have this, this extreme racist of Mark Furman who was right there and, and was right there in the scene and, and could have conceivably planted some of the evidence. I mean, when, when you actually analyze the full body of the evidence, there's really no way that Furman could have planted all of the evidence. He could have planted some but there, there was so much evidence that it was just, it's just not plausible. But anyway, given that there was a history of personal experiences with cops framing their family members or themselves, that's an important thing to think about and an important element in the context in which this trial existed. Not only in the jury's uh, susceptibility to the defense that the cops had had planted this evidence, but also a mentality of, of social justice that needed to happen in this moment. You know, imagine you're a, you're a jury member and you're like, the cops framed my brother and my brother is currently in jail because they framed him. I saw the cop plant that bag of cocaine and the cops are against us. And and I want to put an end to that. I, I want to stop that. And we've tried to stop that. We've had, we've had literal riots in LA to send a message to the cops, and it's still happening. Well, I, I actually now possess the power to put an end to this. Maybe they planted the evidence, maybe they didn't. But I right now, as a jury member, have a very, very real power to strike back in a way that black people in LA had never had before. They had tried to speak up. They had tried to, you know, become activists. They had tried to talk to the media and no one was listening. And so now you're one of, one of the 12 juries, jurors, and you have this ability to say no, no more to the planting of evidence, no more to the brutality of cops on black people. And they knew it was a very popular event, right? They knew that the, the eyes of the world were on them. And they knew that the eyes of the black community in America were on them. And they had this power. And, and, and the jur- jurors have, have said this. In documentary, they actually, the ESPN documentary, they, they actually interview the, a couple of the jury members. And they say as much as this. They say, they basically say this, that, they ruled not guilty because of all the crap that the community was going through. It wasn't just about the OJ Simpson trial and the evidence there. It was about um, sending a message to white LA police force and, and white America and white people in LA that, that you can't fuck with us anymore. We're, we're going to strike back and you can't do this. So that's an important element to know. And, if you're a therapist out there, and I know many of you are, an important thing to think about, because if you're in one of those communities, then you know what this is like. If you're not in one of these communities, then watch the documentary because it, you, you realize what it 
a little bit of what it's like to be in that sort of situation. And the whole Black Lives Matter thing and, and all this stuff, it all emerged, it's all a through line in our country of this, of this real cultural element. When oppressed people are treated like crap and they're not able to get justice, then they are left to resort to things that provide at least a, a smidgen of justice, such as, you know, as the defense is bringing up all these possibilities of planting evidence, you think, well, you know, I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. And before you know it, none of the evidence holds any water anymore. And you then, therefore, have to see that O.J. Simpson is not guilty. There's this other thing that really occurred to me as I was watching the documentary. They interviewed people on the street. They were interviewing back then, right, in 95 during the trial. And they're, they're interviewing white people and black people. And I can't remember exactly what inspired me to have this thought, but I think they're interviewing a, a black guy in the street and they're, they're saying, you know, what, what do you want to see happen? Do you think he's guilty or not guilty? And I, I think the black guy was saying something like, well, I hope he's, I hope that he's not guilty because I don't want the rest of the country and, and really the rest of the world to think of black people as murderers. I don't want that to happen. And I that really hit me actually because I'm I'm a minority member. I'm I'm half Japanese. And I know a lot of people around me like to say, "Ah, you know, you're not really a minority." But I can tell you, dude, if if <laughs> being being half Asian is definitely a minority and it's definitely a person of color and it's definitely an oppressed group. I could go on and on, but but I, I know a little bit of what it's like. It's, it's on the spectrum of being treated unfairly. I have to admit that I am not treated as unfairly as black people in America, but, but I'm definitely treated differently. And I definitely know what it's like to want your people to be represented well, because they're not represented very often. If you're a white person and a white person commits a crime and they, you know, splash a white person's face on the news and say, this man killed these people. My guess is, is that you don't, you can't relate to this, but when you're Asian like me and Asian people aren't in the media that often and when, and they're not noticeable very often. Asians are, are kind of invisible in our society. But every once in a while, an Asian will commit a crime. And when they do commit a crime, I just cringe. And let me give, give, give you an example. I remember there was this famous case in Seattle in the mid-90s, I think 95 or something. There was this warehouse fire in Seattle. And the fire department rushed to the fire and... Uh, you know, to put the fire out. And when they were inside the building, the floor gave way and four of the firefighters died. And it was a really big deal for our city. Four firefighters rushing in. This is after nine, this is before 9-11, rushing into a fire and all four of them die. Well, they investigated the fire and found that the building's owner w likely had uh, started the fire, you know, maybe to get insurance or something. His name was Martin Pang. I think he was Chinese or is Chinese, Chinese American. When they showed his Asian face, Martin Pang, you know, started this fire. And as a result, four of our beloved firefighters are now dead. When I saw his face on the news and he was plastered all over the news in 95 in Seattle, I cringed. And I hoped that he would be found innocent because they said, this is our suspect. We think he might've done it. And I just cringed and I thought, oh my God, I hope that he's innocent of this. Now, why do I care if this guy is innocent or guilty? Well, it's because he's Asian. And as a fellow Asian, I don't want to be associated with this guy. And the reality is, is I will be associated with this guy. Now, when I meet people, they're not going to go like, oh, you're, you must be an arsonist. 
no, it's not that simple. But, but when you're a black American and there's yet another, even OJ, right? OJ is supposed to be this clean cut, you know, wonderful guy. And if, if he is capable of brutally murdering these two people, it's just yet another example. If you're a black person of like, my God, again, you know, like why does every famous black person or, and non-famous black person on the media have to be this, this terrible criminal? I mean, I can't imagine what it's like, you know, now that we have Bill Cosby as this, as this monster, you know, it's just, um, I'm sure very cringeworthy for black people in America. Just like, my God, you know, even our nice famous black people are monsters. It's, 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 it's terrible. And so when, when Martin Pang's face, face was on, on TV, I was just like, please God, make him innocent. But he was found guilty. (laughs) And, I, you know, felt myself uh, wanting to believe that he, that he was innocent. And as a jury member, if I was on Martin Pang's jury, there would be a bias inside of me of like, if I was on the fence about particular pieces of evidence, I would likely err on the side of being in his favor, not because I cared about Martin Pang, but because I cared about my race and I cared about the way my race was seen by America. Because not that I'm narcissistic, it's that when your race is seen in a bad light, then you are negatively impacted. It's not just an intellectual pride thing. We're talking about an actual negative thing that, that can happen to you. For instance, it's you know not lost on black people in 1994 during this trial, 95, during this trial, that if if O.J. Simpson is seen as a monster and a murderer, that more cops are going to be even more convinced that black people are all criminals and that America is going to think of black people as terrible people. It's, 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 it's real. There's a, there's a real impact to the way your society views your race. And so, you know, it makes sense that you'd have a little bit of motivated reasoning as a juror when you're watching this. Now, I don't know if that's the case, but, and they didn't talk about that in the documentary, but that was just something that occurred to me. So in conclusion, I'll just say that if it's difficult for you to understand why those 12 people chose to acquit OJ Simpson, then you have to realize that you just don't understand the cultural context. Because this wasn't just one person making a decision. This is 12 people in a room making a decision to acquit O.J. Simpson. This, this wasn't... How could all 12 of them be idiots, right? They, they weren't idiots. They were smart, normal people. And they existed and still do to some extent, in a very specific cultural context. And if you don't understand why they made that decision, then it's because you don't understand their cultural context. Again, I'll just say it again. How can 12 people all make a stupid decision? I mean, it it happens sometimes. But when you watch the documentary, you realize that they weren't stupid. They were acting in a cultural context that was real and their decision was rational based on that context. The trial was not in isolation. It didn't exist in a vacuum. It happened within a context. And if you understand that context, then you understand that decision. So uh, I challenge you, if you don't understand why they made that decision, I challenge you to, to watch the ESPN documentary and uh, learn where that decision came from. And perhaps to follow in Johnny Cochran's tradition of having uh, catchy, you know, catchy phrases that rhyme, I will say, if the judgment offends, you must extend your cultural understanding. <laughs> if the judgment offends, you must extend yourself. Okay. 
Okay, so this last section, I'm just going to talk about his personality and things that we know about him and why he is the way that he is, is the way that I would put it. Why is O.J. Simpson the way that he is? Why did he commit these murders? Why was he domestically violent? Why did he do the things after the trial? Which I should summarize in that he was later sued in civil court by the Goldmans for being responsible for the deaths of Goldman and and Nicole. And he was found guilty of that or responsible of that or something. The, The threshold in a civil case, as opposed to the criminal case earlier, is much lower. It's instead of being beyond a reasonable doubt or something like that, it's on a preponderance of the evidence, which is just like a 51% threshold. So instead of being like a 90% threshold of guilt, you only need like a 51% threshold of guilt as a jury member. And so he was found to be, to be uh, responsible. Plus the, the trial OJ was on, was on the stand because civil trials apparently are different. And the trial was, was just handled very differently. And so, uh, so he was actually found uh, responsible for the deaths of Goldman and Nicole, or at least Goldman, and had to pay millions of dollars to the Goldmans. Um, he apparently uh, s- tried to sneak out of paying all that, but um, so there's that. And then he returned to his life of playing golf, but people hated him, but also people loved him. It's, it's very interesting to watch the documentary. There are people that are just walking up to him going, I love you, OJ. I love you. I love you so much. And then let me get a picture with you. You're the best. And, and then there are other people that are holding up signs and chasing him around the golf course saying that he's a murderer. And so it's a, it's a very interesting life for him. His media life <clears throat> doesn't really go quite so well. He starts um, identifying more with the black community. So prior to the murders, he was very much in the white community. He rejected the civil rights movement. Uh, He just didn't want to be a part of it. He was surrounded by white people. And after the murder, he uh, started to identify more with black communities. Why he did that, it's hard to know, but, but that's just something that they depict in the documentary. Also, he writes a book. Uh, He gets a ghostwriter, and he says, I want to write a book that talks about uh, a hypothetical situation. Uh, Let's say that I did it. Let's say I killed Nicole and Ronald Goldman. Well, let me tell you, you know, why it happened. But it's just fictional. It's just fictional. And so O.J. Simpson is telling the story, and and eventually the book was uh, published, and it was called If I Did It. And uh, a, there's a chapter or something that depicts the murder, and it basically, uh, OJ was saying that he did it on impulse, and he he did it on accident, and that um, Nicole actually attacked him, and so he killed her in self defense or something, and so uh, so there was that, and then he later, um, in an attempt to get because uh, he wasn't doing well financially, I guess. And so one of the main ways that he always made money was by selling memorabilia and by selling signed footballs and signed jerseys and this kind of stuff. And he thought he had come across a lot of his personal effects. Someone told him that, so there's this guy and he's selling your your personal things. So, you know, It's a long story, but essentially... And in a nutshell, what happened was after he was sued, uh, you know, successfully by the Goldmans, there was a a lot of people that were going into his house and just grabbing things, apparently, uh, and and selling it because you know if you don't have the money, then you essentially have to sell your your junk. And uh, but there are some things that are like his personal things that that aren't. Uh, that shouldn't be sold or I don't know. Anyway, so OJ wanted his personal things back and, and he had heard that this guy who was selling memorabilia had his personal things. And so he went, he got a bunch of his 
friends together and uh, he said, okay, we're, we're going to act intimidating. We're going to act tough and we're going to go there. We're going to intimidate him and we're going to get my stuff back because I want, I, it's my stuff and I deserve it. And so they go into this hotel room, they meet him because, and they act like they're going to buy the memorabilia. This guy's like, yeah, I got this client who really wants to buy stuff. He doesn't tell him it's OJ. And then th- during the meeting, they, they rush in and there's a gun. His friend has a gun and and so they're saying, okay, you know, you can't leave the room and you're going to give us all this stuff. And the guy's like, oh my God, it's OJ. He's in <laughs> this guy that I worship and this guy that I've been selling memorabilia for. He's in my hotel room. This is amazing. And uh, the OJ and his friends, they, they take all the stuff and they walk out of the, they walk out of the hotel. But OJ's like, wait a second, I thought that he was going to have some of my personal things. This is just memorabilia. It's not even my personal thing. So the whole thing was just silly. Well, they get arrested and they uh, go to trial. And normally you would just get like a slap on the wrist or maybe a year in prison or something for it. But the judge uh, convicted OJ of 33 years in prison. <laughs> and uh, and all the experts that I've read and heard said that the judge was clearly convicting OJ on, uh, f- you know, for the murders of Nicole and, and, and Ronald Goldman. So, uh, you know, she, the judge had this ability, this discretion to either sentence OJ to a year or even just probation and on up to, you know, 33 years or maybe more. And she decided to do the full, the, you know, 33 years. And again, to a lot of the experts, it's clear that this was a revenge sentencing for the fact that he was acquitted of the murders in 94. So he's currently in jail right now. And if you want to see just the, the silliness of this crime in this hotel room in Las Vegas, just watch the documentary. It's just, it's, it's really funny um, to watch. I mean, it's not funny, ha-ha, but just, I don't know, comical in a, in a way. But anyway, so, so that's a synopsis of, of his life after the, the trials in the mid-'90s. But let's go into why he is the way that he is. Why did he, did he do all these things that are so strange? Why was he the way that he is? Well, a very common thing that people talk about on the Internet is that he's sociopathic or psychopathic or he's antisocial. Many people diagnose him with this on the internet. According to this perspective, he's evil or he's very disturbed. He was perhaps born that way or due to childhood problems of neglect or abuse or something. He was made to be this evil way. And it just so happens that he was uh, a talented athlete, but it doesn't really relate that much. Um, He, at an early age, figured out how he could get what he wanted from people, and he didn't have any empathy, and he just, he thought that he ruled the world, and he was a psychopath. There's some evidence of this. He was glib, as I said. He was manipulative, He could change his demeanor very quickly to manipulate other people. He could lie very easily. And he didn't care about the law, especially when you think about his entire story. According to, if if you're really trying to shove him into the psychopathic, uh, you know, shoebox here, it's a little difficult because he didn't seem to exhibit psychopathic traits outside of the murder of Nicole and Ronald Goldman. So it's, it's hard to, to do that. But it, according to this perspective, one could make the argument that he was, because of his celebrity status and his talent as a football player, he was given so many things. He was just, you know, people just gave him accolades and and constant, you know, admiration and all this kind of stuff that he never really had to act out or get angry because he was just getting everything he wanted. He could cheat on his wives and no one would say anything and he could get any woman he wanted and he could, 
and everyone, you know, he's surrounded by yes men and everyone, you know, he just, he had it all. And so there wasn't any reason for him to, to act out in an angry way or to, to be mean to other people because he didn't have to be because he was getting everything he wanted until Nicole came along and she didn't always give in to him. She, she would say no. And this was the first person that really challenged his psychopathic um, uh, issues, shall we say. And so when, uh, so he ramped up his efforts to try to try to control her. And when that didn't work, he just killed her. And so that's, that's one way of looking at it, that, that he's sociopathic, psychopathic, antisocial, lack of empathy, wants to control other people to some extent. But really, he doesn't fit the classic uh, or even near the classic presentation of someone with psychopathy. There's, there's not a lot of evidence of an ongoing pervasive pattern of psychopathy throughout his entire life. Now, you could easily make an argument for it. And if someone did, I, I wouldn't really have a leg to stand on to argue against it. But, but he doesn't, in my view, fit this as well as he does fit other issues that I'll get into more later. So in terms of psychopathy and so sociopathy and antisocial personality disorder, I, 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 don't, I don't think, and again, all, as I said at the beginning of this episode, everything that I know about him is through the internet. So I don't really know him, but from, from what I've seen, it, he doesn't really fit the profile. Okay, so we've talked about psychopathy. Now let's talk about misogyny. You know, this is another possible factor in his personality and why he did the things that he did. One could say that he's a misogynist, that he hates women. This is absolutely possible. He was seemingly only terrible towards women uh, in his in his early life, in his early adult life. He cheated on women. He treated them like sex objects. He did not treat his wives well. He beat Nicole. He tried to, you know, there, there was a pervasive pattern of, of sexism and misogyny towards women. Now, is that a result of him being indoctrinated into a misogynistic culture? Hard to know. Uh, but we could say that that probably was a factor. But is that the only reason that he uh, did what he did? No, because misogyny is everywhere in our society. Sexism is everywhere. And very few people would do the things that he did. Okay. Another factor here that I have quite a lot of data on after watching the documentary is that I think that he was not that intelligent, and I know this is a touchy, somewhat taboo topic in our society to talk about intelligence, but from a lot of the evidence, it seems as though he was not the brightest bulb in the pack, if you know what I'm saying. Now, I'm not saying that he was below average intelligence, but I would say that he, he lacked a certain ability to make sound decisions as evidenced by a lot of the things that we've seen. And when you see interviews with him, the way that he talks, he just seems, now again, I haven't evaluated him. Maybe he's a genius. I don't know. But he just seems to lack a certain level of sophistication that could have helped him through life a little bit. Um, and and I think it's a factor. And it's, I think if, as a as a therapist... And as an assessor, you really just have, if you're one of those people, you really just have to think about intelligence. So as I work with my supervisees, a lot of the times when I detect that it's relevant, I will ask the supervisee, I'll say, how intelligent do you think your clients are? How, how intelligent do you think that this client is? Because if you're, if you're below average intelligence, it makes it more difficult to figure out how to navigate the world. And it also, it makes it difficult to interpret things accurately. It makes it difficult to manage social relationships when you're in a tight spot. And so it's something to think about. Now, 
I, I'm not saying that OJ was below average. I'm just saying average intelligence and that if he had 10 or 20 more IQ points, my guess is, is that things would have played out differently, particularly after the murders, because there's just so many things that he did that just lack a certain level of intelligence. Now, again, this is not the cause of his aberrant behavior. You know, being of average intelligence does not cause you to kill people, obviously. But I think that uh, it was a factor, a mediating factor in uh, a lot of the situations that he was in. But anyway, for example, case and point, if you wanted to kill Nicole, if, if he wanted to kill her, which he clearly did, at least in some ways, why not wait until she's alone? I mean, you don't care about Ronald Goldman. I would guess he didn't even know who Goldman was. It's just a guess. Maybe he did. But if but his primary beef was with Nicole, right? So why not wait until she's alone? It'd be a lot easier. Also, why not use a gun? Because guns don't leave blood like all over your body, right? It's, it's uh, you know, it, I'm sure he could have got his hands on a gun. You know, it. he obviously did not want to be caught in this crime. He, uh, right afterwards, like I was saying earlier, he's like, oh, crap, what did I do? My only way out of this is to commit suicide. Why did he do what he did? I mean, it's just so stupid. There are other ways that you will see people commit murder. You know, when they decide, yeah, I'm, I'm done with this person. I, I'm going to kill her. You will see smarter decisions. Now, it sounds funny to say smart because it sounds like I'm endorsing the decisions. I'm not endorsing. I'm just saying more well thought out decisions. Let's just put it that way. He immediately after the murders went on record with police officers and told them several different stories. He didn't even in his mind consolidate some consistent story that he was going to tell people. He was just thinking off the top of his head when he talked to police officers, when he talked to his friends. Um, there were there in the documentary they talk about it how how he, he you know he had that cut on his hand and one of his friends asked him, it's like, oh, you know, where'd you get that cut? And he said one story. And then an hour later someone else asked him, how'd you get that cut? And he says another story. And then an hour later, someone asked him, how'd you get that cut? And he says yet another story. And that's just not smart behavior. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, regardless of your personality problems, to tell police officers and a bunch of other people different stories is not going to help in your, uh, you know, attempts to exonerate yourself from this crime, Right. It's just like lying 101, right, is to be consistent with your lies and, and try to make them hold up. And so, uh, again, it's just another reason why I'm 100% sure that he killed those people is because when you hear the accounts of the various stories, I mean, it, yeah, anyway. And look at the crime itself. He, he leaves the, his hat at the crime and one of the bloody gloves and he wears these very distinctive shoes and leaves all these bloody footprints everywhere. Then he immediately gets in his white Bronco, which doesn't help right when you have a, a blood, a red blood stain on a white Bronco. And it seems like he doesn't even attempt to clean that up. Then he drops the other bloody glove in you know, outside of his house behind, uh, what's his face's bungalow. What was that guy's name? Um, Cato Kalin. And then he goes into his house and tr tracks a bunch of all three of their people, all three people's blood. He, you know, tracks a bunch of it into his house. I mean, that's just like, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that he should have covered it up. I'm just saying that if he was smarter, 10 or 20 more IQ points, he wouldn't have done those things. Also, uh, again, just 101 criminal behavior is you talk to your lawyer before you talk to the police. And he didn't do that. He, he allowed himself to be interrogated by, by the police. 
now when you watch a documentary, you realize the police completely flubbed that, that, um, that interview, that first interrogation, but that's another story. Um, there's just many different examples of how bad of a liar he was. And this is more reason why I don't think he was a psychopath because psychopaths early in life learn how to lie. Well, they learn how to be consistent in their stories because they, they, they lie so often as children that through trial and error, they, they learn how to lie and manipulate. OJ Simpson was a terrible liar. He, was just terrible at it. You, you can see him lying very easily. It's very easy to detect his lies. <laughs> and so when you watch the documentary, you just think, my God, he was a bad liar. Another thing you can point to in terms of his lack of intelligence was that he was ruining his career with the domestic violence. He was a celebrity. People loved him. And his ability to make money and his ability to be well liked in you know the community was dependent on his image. That was a you know perhaps all of his of his uh, assets. You know all of the all of the reason why he was making money post football was the fact that people liked him. They loved him. They thought he was a great guy. Well, out you know the domestic violence and the the. Um, intimate partner violence that he was committing was a serious challenge to his most fate, you know, his most prized asset, which was his likability. And he was repeatedly doing it. And imagine you're, you're a massive celebrity and you lose control one night and the cops come. Well, wouldn't the next day, wouldn't you wake up just mortified that that had happened? And wouldn't you say, my God, I, I, I hate my I hate my wife and you know even if you thought that she deserved it which I'm guessing he did but even if so let's just say you wake up in the morning you you even think your wife deserved what she got so to speak well if you had 10 or 20 more in you know IQ points you would say to yourself look I need to get out of this situation because this is going to destroy my career I've got to divorce her we've got to end this I don't care how much I like this woman. I don't, I don't care how much I want to be with her. This is not working, especially after the second time, the third time it happens, the fourth, the 10th, the 20th time. You think eventually you would say, this is not working. I need to figure out something else. And we're just not happy together. Let's just break up. But he didn't do that. So now there are other reasons why he might have done that, which I'll get into more later. But again, just a little bit of an intelligence issue. And before I go further here, I just want to say, I'm not saying that black people are unintelligent. I'm saying that O.J. Simpson was of average intelligence. I'm not even saying he's below average. I'm saying he was average intelligence. Uh, this is not an, in, an indictment on black people. And I, so just want to make sure that that's very clear here. Because as I talk about O.J. Simpson being a black man and even just bringing up the idea of intelligence... I know that the cultural context is such that it might be a touchy subject for some people because black people are often portrayed as stupid. And even in my field as, as a therapist and in psychology, black people have been oppressed and uh, the tests have been, you know, IQ tests have been designed in such a way that it favors white people and will therefore. Uh, find that black people are less intelligent. If, if you just look at the IQ tests, when you look at race, black people are not as smart as white people, according to the IQ tests, the, the major ones that we have in psychology. But of course, that's ridiculous. It's just not, it's just not, not possible. It's not likely, let's just say. And so why would black people on average score far less on the IQ test. Well, obviously the tests must be favoring of white people. And so, so our, our society has a, and my field has a history of this sort of thing. So I, I understand that there could be a touchy issue around talking about the intelligence of a black person. So I'm not saying I believe me, understand that black people are just as intelligent as white people and have the same distribution curve when it comes to intelligence. But so just being clear about that. 
So, but again, getting back to his, his issues regarding decision-making, shall we say, as I said earlier, he published a book with a ghostwriter titled, If I Did It, in which he describes a fictional account, quote unquote fictional, of how he killed Nicole and Ronald. And in this account, he claims that he went over to her house just to scare her. You know, he wore this black outfit and he brought this knife and he, all he wanted to do was scare her. But then Ronald Goldman shows up and he gets jealous and he confronts Goldman and Nicole then attacks OJ. He says that all he was trying to do was scare Nicole, but then, whoa, there's this Goldman guy. And then he got jealous and he goes over to Goldman. And he says, yeah, get out of here. And then, and then Nicole attacks OJ but then she falls on her head and hits her, hits her head on the ground. And then he says that Goldman gets into a quote unquote karate stance. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a child's excuse for something. If you, you know what I mean? Like when you think about it, it's like, come on, you know? Anyway, so, so OJ is saying, you know, to the ghostwriter, this is what I want you to write. And he says, Goldman then got into a quote unquote karate stance. And then that triggered OJ to act. And then he, OJ claims that something took over and he just acted in self-defense and he attacked Goldman and killed him. And then he attacked uh, Nicole. And the next thing he knew they were dead. And in this book, Years after being acquitted, he essentially confessed to killing them and provides a very lame story to make it seem like he was acting in self-defense. And it's also clear to me that he wanted to publish this book to make money because he knew that... If you watch the documentary, you can see that at first, he just wanted to go back to his normal life and he wanted to be OJ. And he was like, hey, I was acquitted, so everyone's going to love me again. And then he figures out, no, it's not going to, it's not that simple. And so part of him just wanted people to love him and he just wanted attention. And at a certain point, he's like, well, if I publish a book that said, if I did it, then I'm going to get a bunch more attention. And, and I think he, he, that's why he did this. Now, again, 10 or 20 more IQ points might have led him down a decision trail of saying, uh, I don't think this is a good idea to publish this book. It's probably not a good idea. I'm probably not going to get really what I want out of this. Because, one, I still owe, owe, owe the Goldmans a bunch of money because even though he was sued for something like 30 plus million dollars, he, the, he never actually paid all of it, I think. But anyway, so... Is that a smart decision to make a book uh, in which you essentially confess to murdering them, but then you try to act like it was self-defense? I mean, come on. That's just, you know, it, that's just not smart decision, decision making. And this isn't an impulsive decision like, oh, I think I'll write a book today, blah, blah, blah. You know, this was something that he thought about for a long time. And I'm assuming someone around him was like, I don't know if that's such a great idea, Juice. And, you know, he also made, like I said earlier, that Juiced show which was like a reality. It was like punked. I don't know if you know the punked show, but it was essentially like a candid camera show in which he was like, Hey, you've been juiced. And you really just have to watch some of these episodes. It's bizarre. He tries to sell people this, this white Bronco and he makes all these jokes about the murders and about his, you know, run from the, the cops and all this stuff. And it's, it's bizarre. And you just have to wonder about the intelligence of this man. And you just have to wonder about his ability to make sound decisions. So, you know, I don't know. I haven't evaluated him, but I think, I think intelligence plays a role. Because let's just imagine that he was a lot smarter. Would he have made different decisions? My guess is, is yes. That's what I contend. I contend that if, if he were 10 or 20 points, wherever he is on the scale of intelligence whether it's average or above average, doesn't matter. If, if he were more intelligent, would he have made different decisions? My guess is, is he would have made different. Now, is that the primary factor in all of it? Absolutely not. Because, 
I'll get into more of his personality issues that I think played into it. But I think that his intelligence played somewhat of a role. And when you watch a documentary, you can, you can, you can see this clear through line of not the brightest uh, of decisions. Okay. So something else to think about is what Bowen called undifferentiation. How fused was he? You can see through the, Bo- the Bowenian lens that he had a lot, a lot of what they call the pseudo-self. Bowen liked to talk, to talk about people as having two selves. They had your basic self or your true self, and then your pseudo-self or the self that you portray to other people, the self that is malleable to the social situation. So there's the true you, and then there's the social you that is affected by other people. You know, your pseudo self is the self that is a self you put out there to try to please other people. When you have no sense of who you are, when you're not differentiated, as Bowen would put it, and when you have a lot of fusion with other people, you tend to define yourself through other people a lot. And there's some evidence that O.J. Simpson defined himself through his relationship with Nicole, that when his relationship was going well in his eyes and he had her attention and he possessed her, so to speak, as a wife, that he considered his life to be going well. And when she decided to reject him and say, I don't think I like this situation anymore, he lost it and would become possessive and violent and eventually killed her. This is perhaps evidence of undifferentiation, the inability to soothe himself, the, in, the inability to, to know who he was aside from his relationship with Nicole. He seemed to, there's, there's some evidence that he, he really defined himself through his uh, through the eyes of other people, that the way other people saw him was who he was. And when Nicole saw him in a good light, then he could relax. And when Nicole had a problem with him, then that, that triggered him and that made it very difficult for him to cope. We all do this. You know, we all define ourselves, at least to some extent, if not to a great extent, by the way other people see us. But when things are going badly and other, and other people see us in a negative light, then we have to have an ability to resort to the way our, we see ourselves from our, from our own perspective. If our spouse is very upset and saying nasty things about us, we have to have the ability to say, okay, that's what they're saying, but I know that I, I'm basically a good person I might have some flaws, but I, I know that I'm basically a good person and I'm, and I'm okay even though this person is saying all these really nasty things about me. You need the ability to do that. And it seems as though in the Bowenian language that OJ did not have that ability, that he had too much pseudo-self, not enough basic self, and that he lacked differentiation from other people, that other people's opinions of him were the dominant way in which he viewed himself. Okay, so we've looked at his potential for sociopathy and psychopathy. We've looked at misogyny and sexism. We've looked at his intelligence. We've looked at his differentiation. The other thing that we might be able to point to as a factor is his fame. One could say that fame played a role in his perception of himself and his entitlement and his ability to cope with stress and this kind of thing. There are a lot of examples of celebrities having problems after they achieve massive amounts of fame. And OJ possessed massive amounts of fame. And one of the things that you'll see is that a lot of yes men surround people like this. And when that happens, that that gets to you. You know, when when everything you say and everything you do is seen as wonderful by your immediate, you know, the people around you, then that changes the way that you see yourself. And when society loves you, no matter what you do, that also will tend to change you. 
when you have no consequences to your behavior, when you can yell at a friend and that friend who was in your entourage will come back to you because they get certain perks about being close to you, then that changes who you are, I think. And you get away with things and you start to have a very distorted view of yourself and of your entitlement. And when, when Nicole decided to turn on him and say, I'm not going to put up with this anymore, that could have you know, been affected the way, he, the way that he saw that situation. It could have been affected by his fame and by his celebrity status and the fact that everyone around him was saying yes to everything that he said. And then he has this one person that's close to him saying no for the first time in his, in his uh, adult life. He could have felt like, well, I'm, a, I'm basically a god. I'm a celebrity. And you're not going to do that to me. And I'm going to kill you because I'm, I'm me. I'm, I'm the juice. And this is, again, not to say that all famous people are prone to killing their spouses when they're upset, but, but it could have played a role. We all, after a difficult breakup or after a difficult fight, will have fantasies of aggression at some point in our life. You know, you, you go through a difficult divorce and many people will have at least small fantasies of aggression. Like it could be small as I, I'm going to, I'm going to slash his tires. He pissed me off so bad. He, you know, he, he said that in court, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to slash his tires. But you know, some people, and I talk to them will be very disturbed and I'll tell them that to some extent it's normal as long as they don't act on it, obviously, but they will have quite elaborate fantasies of harming their, their ex spouse or that person at work that humiliated them or something. It's, it's not uncommon to have these sorts of fantasies. There's a big leap between having fantasies and actually doing it by the way. But, but it were, were, it's normal to have those, those kinds of fantasies. Well, when you're perhaps very famous. I don't know what it's like, but when you're a celebrity and very famous, maybe you're more likely to act on those fantasies because you you just think, well, I'm I'm the juice. I'm going to get away with it. I've gotten away with all these other things. Of course, I'll get away with that. And and for for many people, the reason why they don't act on those fantasies when they're at their lowest low might be because they're thinking, well, surely I'll get caught and that will be bad for me. So. Now, I'm not saying that all people going through a divorce want to kill their ex-spouse. That's not what I'm saying. But uh, what I'm saying is that when you mix his fame and all the yes men and all the celebrity and the sort of like godlike status that celebrities get in our society, and you mix that in with the pain of a divorce, you could see how that might play uh, another contributing factor in his decision to do what he did and then his later decisions as well. Okay, so we've talked about fame, undifferentiation, his intelligence, sexism, psychopathy. I'm also going to bring up PTSD. Now, there's no evidence that he had PTSD, but that isn't to say that he didn't have it. In my experience, when I see stuff like this, often when I start to assess, it becomes clear pretty quickly that there's some sort of trauma, whether it's full-blown PTSD or some other trauma reaction. A lot of times when people act aggressively, it's because they've been traumatized and that trauma is, is touched upon, that wound is touched upon, or they're, they've been triggered by a particular situation. And it's possible that he had PTSD and that he became aggressive when he was triggered. I don't have any evidence of that, but it just seems possible. Hard, hard to know, though. Okay, so that's PTSD. Another uh, factor that you really can't ignore is racism in our society. One could say that his, his victimization through racism played a role in his decisions in life. It's a, it's a particularly compelling argument for me anyway. Growing up black in America, especially back then, was a terrible experience. It was, 
uh, you know, filled with being put down, people giving you bad looks, people calling you names just because you're a black kid in San Francisco. They talk about this in the documentary. They're saying, you know, you think of San Francisco as this as this love place and everyone loves each other. Well, in the 50s and 60s, it was not that way. There, there was the right side of the tracks and there was the wrong side of the tracks. And they grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. And you're you're constantly made to feel lesser and stupid, not intelligent, unwanted, not good enough. You're constantly made to feel like you're a criminal and that you should go back to Africa. And you internalize these messages. You internalize these messages like, I'm a bad person. I'm lesser. I'm not as good as white people. I hate myself for who I am. I hate myself for my race. There is a an internalized sense of that that happens. It doesn't just happen on the outside. It happens on the outside. People are saying nasty things and thinking nasty things. But over time, you internalize these messages, particularly as children and and as adolescents. You internalize these messages of, I must be a bad person. I must be a criminal. I must be lesser. And this is an important thing to think about. As my colleague, Jerry Saltzman, would say, he had internalized oppression. So when you're treated this way and you have all these internalized messages, that can affect your personality and it can affect your sense of entitlement and it can affect your reactions to being rejected. When society is rejecting you constantly just based on who you are as a human being, the fact that your skin is a different color than they want it to be, you can internalize this sense of of deep rejection and of hurt. And when that wound is triggered by a spouse who is divorcing you, then that can become even more hurtful or it can become, you can become even more reactive to that. And when she's white, that could perhaps be even more pronounced for him, that all his life he's been trying to get into the white world so that they will accept him, but they, they never really accept him. They're always like, well, he's, he's still black. And then you get this beautiful white wife and she rejects you. And it, it could have just been the final straw for him. Now, again, do all black men who are rejected by their white friends and wives. Do they go out and kill people? No, but it it could have been a factor. The fact that, that he was black and that he experienced that racism throughout his life and that, um, you know, that in all likelihood affected who he was and, and how he felt about things, you know, it just seems like it's likely a factor. Okay. So the last bit of discussion I'll say here is, I think, the most relevant. It's what the, 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 the last fact, so I'll just review the factors I've talked about so far again. I've talked about sociopathy which I don't, and psychopathy, which I don't think really fits. It's close, but doesn't really fit. We have sexism and misogyny, which likely played a role. We talked about his evidence of his decision-making skills or intelligence, uh, which likely pl- played a role in his ultimate decisions. We have his fusion or undifferentiation. We have his fame and how that gets to you. We have potential for PTSD. There's some, there's some yellow flags of PTSD. And then we, we have his victimization of racism. Well, the last factors or the last conceptualizations of OJ Simpson and his personality and why he did what he did is narcissism and attachment. I'm, I'm going to discuss both of them basically in one clump, even though they're different ideas. I'm going to discuss both of, them, both of them in one section here because I think that when you consider narcissism alone, it doesn't really quite fit. When you, when you think of attachment alone, it doesn't really quite fit. But when you think of narcissism and attachment regarding O.J. Simpson together, you, I think, in my view, get a, a very coherent explanation for who he is as a human being and why he did the things that he did. And again, just as a caveat, I say I have to say everything I know about him is through the internet and through the media, so I could be completely wrong about all this. But anyway, so 
there seems to be some evidence that he had attachment injuries as a child. As I talked about earlier, his dad wasn't around much, and, and OJ even said that that hurt him, and he was upset about that. As I also said earlier, he was one of four children in a single-parent home that was very stressed out, and uh, you can imagine that mother didn't have all that uh, uh, time to pay attention to all of her children. And so there's there's a very good likelihood that OJ grew up in uh, in an environment of emotional neglect. Not because the mom is a bad mom, but because it's difficult to raise four kids while you're, you know, poor and and working and all this kind of stuff. So so in all like so there's there's a lot of evidence that he incurred a lot of attachment injuries as a young child. And he got attachment later on in life through fame. This is my conceptualization. I, I don't know if people talk about this very much, but but in my estimation, as he as he started to enter adolescence, he and and he started to play football and he started to run. He was also a a, a fast uh, track runner. I don't know the exact terminology, but he ran track in in college. I think and I think he even held the records and stuff for the hundred yard dash. But he was uh, very fast in in track and 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 he was a very accomplished football player. And so he, in in my conceptualization, he was for the first time able to get his attachment needs through fame and through sports. People paid attention to him. They loved him for who he was. And so that compelled him to be even better as an athlete. He really pushed himself. He had natural talent for sure, but he, he obviously worked hard to get to where he was. Well, then you fast forward in his life and he then, after his football career, he's like, well, I, I need that, that attention. I need that attention because I, was, I didn't get enough of it as a child. And the way that I get love is by being, by being a celebrity, by being good at what I do. And so he starts turning to acting and he really pours himself into it. And you, in the document, you can really see that. You can really see him saying, I'm, I'm, I need to become an actor. I need to become accomplished. I need to become well-liked in the media. Just being a football player is not enough. I need people to like me. And so he got a lot of his needs that way. Now, he was not a good husband during this time, and he was cheating, but he wasn't murderous, shall we say. Well, as his celebrity status started to wane in the early 90s, he started to depend more on Nicole to validate him. And that doesn't often work so well when you require your spouse to validate you emotionally as a human being. It uh, has a, a lot of pitfalls to that because if that's your sole way of seeing yourself as a good person, then that's a heavy burden for a spouse to carry. And will inevitably lead to dysfunction. And so it did. And then Nicole and that and him started to fight and then Nicole starts pulling away even more and more. Well at this point, OJ really wants attention from his parents, uh, because that's the original injury. He didn't get that. He would love to go back to football, but he's older now. He can't do that. He would like to be celebrity status and he has some of that, but maybe not enough, and it's that's starting to fade. So he really needs it from Nicole. And at, at this moment, their relationship starts to become dysfunctional. And so this attachment injury for him becomes very pronounced. And he can't seem to get the his attachment needs met during this time. And he becomes increasingly triggered. And this attachment wound becomes increasingly touched upon. And he becomes increasingly desperate for attachment, for security, for someone to love him consistently and he's so desperate and he can't soothe himself he can't emotionally regulate because he he wasn't given enough attachment security as a child and so as she's pulling away he starts to freak out more and more and more now i'll stop here and say that people who have these attachment wounds 
you know, 99.99% of these people would never kill someone as a result. So this is actually a, a quite common thing. But the franticness, and you get this from the documentary, how emotionally frantic he was during that time. You you get a sense of that. And, I, and the lens I see that through is through attachment security. For example, he was terrified that Nicole was going to cheat on him hired investigators as i talked about earlier he was obsessed with trying to prevent her her from cheating on him and through all this fighting and and whatnot it drove her away from him which drove her towards other men and actually drove her toward his one of his good friends marcus allen which i found to be a fascinating twist of the story that i didn't know about until the documentary if you're a football fan you know marcus allen he was the next O.J. Simpson, the younger, you know, the younger, faster version of O.J. Simpson, and O.J. and Marcus Allen became friends, and and then Nicole Brown Simpson and Marcus Allen became friends, and then they started having an affair. I think I don't know if it was an affair or it was after their separation, but you know, this obviously disturbed O.J. Simpson and really hurt his feelings. And so uh, this is to this is a further jab at the wound of his attachment injury. So as I said, there are many people that have this attachment wound. It's a very common wound for people to have, at least to some degree. There are people with mild versions of this. Many people do, and there are people with moderate and severe versions of this of this attachment wound of being of being neglected and feeling unwanted and feeling uncared for. There. So when you have millions of people with this condition, you also have many different ways to cope with it. You have many different ways that people will exhibit symptoms of the insecure attachment and uh, things like acting out, things like becoming um, violent with people. Uh, Another common way of coping is to use substances like alcohol or marijuana to numb the pain when you are feeling lonely and you don't feel like anyone loves you a, a very easy way to cope with that is to drink and then you you know you no longer feel that way anymore you could become a workaholic you could dive into work and try to become very good at that because at least at work you can get the accolades that you would really rather have from your your family and loved ones you can develop personality disorders like borderline personality. And I've talked about that before, but you know, you can develop a kind of frantic effort to avoid being rejected. You can become depressed, you can become anxious. And there there are many other ways that people will quote unquote cope with attachment insecurity. And and the final one I want to mention is perhaps the most relevant to OJ Simpson, and that is narcissism. Narcissism is a way of of coping, so to speak, or is a is a symptom of attachment insecurity for people. When you lack attachment security, one way you can psychologically cope with it is to start to believe that you are you're a wonderful person. All children have this have this dichotomy between they, there's a part of them that believes they're the center of the universe because it just seems that way to them. When you're three and, and two and one, the world revolves around you. Your parents in a normal family will come to you and feed you and give you things and carry you around and, and react to you and notice you. And so you really believe that the world revolves around you and developmentally your brain is sort of set up that way. And so there's a certain amount of narcissism, and over time, we learn that we're not, as we age, we more and more learn we're not the center of the universe and that, and that there's a healthy progression to that. Well, if at an early age, you're not allowed to experience the full breadth of your healthy, normal narcissism, if at the age of three, you're not attended to enough, even though you believe that you deserve it then you become to some extent stuck in that narcissism. And there's this question mark around whether or not you're good enough to deserve the attention of other people. And 
you, it becomes a complex throughout your life of wondering, am I good enough for attention? And, and then when you do get attention, it, it feels very satisfying and you become very needy of this attention from other people as a way of validating who you are. And you, you tend not to have the ability to soothe yourself and you, you lack an inner self. You lack an inner sense of who you are. When children are given enough attention and are allowed to experience their narcissism in a healthy way, they emerge from that with a sense of who they are. They can reflect on themselves and say like, this is who I am and this is what I feel. And okay, this person doesn't like me, but I know that I'm a good person or this person doesn't like me and you know what, I'm going to listen to what they have to say. And I have a foundation of self-esteem that can withstand criticism when someone says something negative about me and my wife is, is saying that she doesn't like what I'm doing. I have a, I have a foundation of self-esteem I can stand on and say, well, I know I'm a basic, basically a good person and you know what, maybe there are some things about me that aren't so good just a few things. And this person is alerting me to that. And, and so I, I can take it, you know, imagine you're at work and you, you have a boss and your boss always tells you negative things. Well, it, it becomes hard to listen to criticism at that point. But if your boss tells you a hundred good things and appreciates you for all the hard work you're doing, and then says one tiny little negative thing about you, it's easier to hear that. So you say, well, my boss really likes me and appreciates me. And my boss has, you know, this tiny little criticism. So when you are neglected in, you know, and you have attachment injuries as a, as a child, one way to cope is, is to just become stuck in narcissism and to just try to try to pump up yourself the you know, your self esteem through this distorted view of yourself and your place in the universe by believing that you're special, by believing that you're better than other people, and by envying other people for having what they have and, and wanting to get what they have, and for being very uh, sensitive to criticism. And uh, this is a way of dealing with that attachment injury. And so let's talk about narcissism. Now, when I, when I talk about narcissism, I'm not talking about necessarily the full-blown personality disorder. We live in a world now that is dominated by the DSM. And so um, I just want to point out that for many decades, going back to Freud, the, the term narcissism was a more broad term. And that's the term that I use. Because although some people with narcissism can be characterized as having narcissistic personality disorder as defined in the DSM. There are many more people who have narcissistic traits that do not fit the diagnosis. And it's worth noticing and, and discussing. So, as I said, the history of the term narcissism goes back before Freud, but Freud uh, really began the discussion regarding narcissism as a personality trait in 1914. And many of the major figures in psychoanalysis wrote about narcissism after Freud. All, perhaps all the major prominent psychoanalytic writers uh, commented on it at least somewhat. In the mid 20th century, Kohut and Kernberg became quite uh, famous for bringing narcissism into uh, the, they, they made it a central feature in their theory about people and they expanded the definition and really really worked on the concept of narcissism and personality so when you when you think narcissistic uh, traits often people will think of kohut so there are since so many people have discussed it over the decades there's many many definitions of what narcissism is and so whenever any of us talk about narcissism you really have to define it or discuss it further. Just, just the label narcissism itself. Whenever I hear that, I'm always wondering, well, what do you mean by narcissism? You know, what is, what is your definition? And in the lay public and in the media, narcissism gets thrown around very, very easily. And in a way, I think it's, it's basically just a label for anyone that people don't like. 
people, you know, if someone doesn't like someone, oh, they're narcissistic. But, you know, in my view, that's, that's not accurate. Well, so just to start off the conversation about narcissism, let's, let's read the DSM here. What does the DSM? So this is narcissistic personality disorder, and you could just say it's an extreme form of narcissism is what I would say. So it says here, the criteria, a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior. It's also a need for admiration. It's also a lack of empathy. And it begins in early adulthood, at least, and is present in a variety of contexts. And it is indicated by at least five of the following criteria. Again, a grandiose sense of self, You exaggerate your achievements. You expect to be recognized as superior by others. Number two, you're preoccupied with fantasies of achievement and success and power and brilliance and beauty or ideal love, they often mention. So people can be narcissistic about needing to have the ideal marriage, which is interesting. Number three, the person believes that They are special and unique and can only be understood by other people of high status. This is important. This is actually an interesting uh, commonality among narcissistic people is that they they believe they're special and they will only, they'll try to associate with what they consider to be other special people. They will not, they, they will measure themselves against other people and say like, okay, well, I'm, I'm on the scale of specialness. I'm, I'm a 95 and that person, eh, they're about a 70. So I, I'm not going to listen to what they have to say. I don't really want to hang out with them. Ooh, that person is a 90. So I'm going to hang out with that person because that person's in my class. And so that's another element of narcissism. It's very socially defined in that way. Number four, they require excessive admiration. Number five, they feel entitled, you know, they have unreasonable expectations of favorable treatment from other people. Number six, they are interpersonally exploitative. You know, they take advantage of other people so that they can get what they want out of them. Number seven, they lack empathy. They are unwilling to recognize uh, other people's feelings. Number eight, they're often envious of others. And they also believe that others are envious of them. So envy is a big deal in their life. They're not only envious of others, but they also think, oh, that person's probably jealous of me and wants my life. Of course, they're, they're jealous of me. And number nine, they're arrogant, and they have uh, arrogant attitudes and arrogant behaviors. So those are the criteria. Now, before I go further, I just want to say that as I've said in other podcasts, personality disorders are extremely difficult to diagnose. You could probably easily, if you just really stretched your criteria just slightly, you could probably find that 75% of the people you know fit the criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. But the chance that 75% of your friends are you know, have the disorder, according to what clinicians would say, they, you know, someone who has it, is extremely low. Personality disorders, people who qualify for personality disorders are really quite severe, and they're quite obvious. There's a chance that you've actually never even met someone with narcissistic personality disorder. I think something like just like 1% or 2% of the population has it. Um, yeah, when one point eight four. And so very few people have this, have this disorder. Now, you might know someone that's arrogant. You might know someone that seems entitled or seems to lack empathy. But personality disorders are very distinctive. And when you meet someone with a personality disorder, it feels very different than someone who just has, you know, sort of some arrogance or sort of some entitlement or sort of some privilege or something. And as I've said in other podcasts, uh, in order to diagnose someone with a personality disorder, you have to assess them over time. You have to assess them perhaps over the span of weeks, if not months. Like with borderline, you can't diagnose someone 
based on five minutes or even an hour of sitting with them. You have to you have to experience their personality over many, many sessions. And you have to be very well versed in being able to understand personality. In this way, a lot of clinicians aren't really able to diagnose people properly in this way. I've seen people diagnose people with borderline and narcissism and you know in two minutes. And that's just not possible. It's not possible to know enough about someone to diagnose them. Now, with anxiety disorders or depression, you can I can diagnose someone with depression in 10 seconds if the conditions are right. If they if they tell me a few key features in a very short amount of time, I can say you qualify for a diagnosis of major depressive disorder or you qualify for this, you know, phobia or something. I can diagnose and other clinicians can too. You can diagnose some things very quickly because it's not that complicated. But personality disorders are extremely complicated. I, I've worked with supervisees that after years, they'll say, I still don't get borderline. They'll say, I just don't get it. You won't hear people say that about anxiety or depression. You don't hear people years into the profession saying, I don't get depression. Why? Because depression, for whatever reason, is very easy to understand. Personality disorders, extremely difficult. There's even a certain movement to er eliminate personality disorders from the DSM altogether because they they're in a special class of their own. And for that reason, they're, they're I don't know, they're just very difficult to, to understand. So I just want to point that out. All right. In a nutshell, what is narcissism? Well, this is my conceptualization. So take that, uh, consider that as I say this. But in a nutshell, because the person lacks a sense of self or a good enough self-esteem. When, when we say lacking a sense of self, it often means uh, an overlapping concept of self-esteem, the ability to, to, to hold on to who you are and to, to, to reassure yourself and to have a foundation of, of self-esteem. When, when you lack that, you become overly concerned with the admiration of other people to validate yourself. And you become extremely vulnerable to criticism and to rejection from other people. And you become extremely vulnerable to being ignored by other people. Or you become vulnerable to other people not being, you know, not expressing admiration of you. So, but it's all, it's not based on this desire to be evil. It's based on this desire to make up for the fact that you lack self-esteem. Now, there's some research and some authors that have some compelling arguments that narcissistic people actually don't lack self-esteem. They actually just have too much self-esteem. And, and to some extent, I agree with that. I, th I find that there are basically two different kinds of narcissists. You have the narcissists, in, in my estimation, most of them are in this first category, of people who lack self-esteem and are trying to compensate by, by distorting their world to make it seem like they're a god but really deep down, they're, they're very, very low self-esteemed. But there's a smaller category of narcissistic people that actually don't have that underlying sense of low self-esteem. They actually just, for whatever reason, think they're a god. <laughs> and um, and I, I've seen some evidence of that. But most of the time, in, when I experience narcissists, it's because they lack self-esteem for reasons related to their childhood. And this results in narcissistic people exhibiting a lack of empathy for others, not because they actually lack empathy, but because they are consumed with feelings of self-doubt and emptiness. All of us will exhibit a lack of empathy if we're pushed hard enough. If you have, if I somehow, you know, or not me, but let's say someone makes you feel just terrible about yourself and you just have just days of feeling terrible about yourself and this person is is just cutting you down and, and other people are joining in. Well, at the end of that you know month, my guess is, is you're not going to have a lot of resources to have empathy for other people. Well, that's what it's like for people with narcissistic disorder, you know, personality disorder and people with narcissism. It's not that they lack empathy. It's not, it's not like a psychopath or a sadist or something. It's, it's that they, actually I should listen that some, some people say, as I've said before, sadism actually 
can have empathy. But psycho, the, the central feature to psychopathy and, and antisocial personality disorder in my conceptualization is that you just lack the ability to empathize with other people. And I don't think that that's the central feature of, of narcissism. In fact, I think it's just a, a minor symptom of it. It's a very bothersome symptom of it, but it's a symptom of the fact that when you're hurting and when you're vulnerable to uh, being hurt by other people through these social narcissistic ways, then you just don't have the resources for empathy in those moments. And so, and, and when you're triggered, when your narcissism and your low self-esteem is triggered, you're going to be very hurt and you're going to come out swinging. And that's what narcissists will do. That's a, a central feature that you will find for a lot of people with narcissism is that they tend to get very angry when their narcissism is challenged. It's something that a lot of people will will turn to as 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 a it's, it's a it's a sign when you see that someone gets very angry and vindictive towards the people particularly that they love. It's a it's a major flag, major red flag for narcissistic personality disorder. So it's just how I conceptualize it. Now some people will say differently. They'll say narcissism. Uh, part of it is just an inherent lack of empathy, but that's not that's not how I see it. Okay, so now let's look at O.J. Simpson. So again, this is all in the context of attachment and narcissism. He clearly needed attention. When you watch the documentary, it's clear that he needed attention. A- after the trials for the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman, many people would just move to, you know, Mexico and become, and just start over, right? Or at the very least, just, just, you know, lay low. But that wasn't what he wanted. He wanted, immediately he wanted to be in the limelight again. And he wanted that attention. He needed that attention. He, want, you know, he wrote that book. He got on that punked show called Juiced. He just was so desperate for attention. And that's very clear. Okay. Well, that's a narcissistic trait. When you lack self-esteem and the only way you can sort of build a a fantasy of self-esteem is when everyone loves you, then you need to become a celebrity and you need to enact your celebrity status. There's also a lot of footage where he just walks down the street and people will walk up to him and say, Oh, I love you, Juice. And this is after the murders, you know, mind you. And he, he'll stop and, you know, he'll interact with them. Now, some people would say, well, OJ is just a nice guy. He's a cool guy. But another way of putting it is this, that's, he needed that. That was his fuel. Without that admiration from the crowds, he felt empty. He felt, he felt terrible. And this was exhibited by, they, they interviewed him or they had some recorded conversation with him because he's in jail right now, right? For that crime of breaking into the hotel room, not breaking in, but of uh, threatening that guy and taking all this stuff in Las Vegas. He, in an interview or something, was saying, this is all in the documentary, that he feels completely empty inside. And to me, this is the nail in the coffin for the narcissistic um, personality trait. When he's in prison, there's no celebrity status. I mean, I'm guessing other inmates might treat him in a certain way, but there's, there's not the constant celebrity accolades when you're in prison. And he can't clamor for attention. He can't try to publish a book while he's there. He can't, he can't get on TV and this sort of thing. And because that has been the primary way he has coped with his lack of attachment security, he is left by himself and he feels empty. You will hear people say that. You'll, you will hear narcissistic people say that when, when they are left alone, when they, when they are not wrapped up in the act of getting attention or, and when they're not wrapped up in the act of attacking people for not giving them enough attention, when they just sort of stop, they will feel very empty inside. Borderline people will say this too. They will say, I feel empty, like there's just nothing in here. And 
so it's just another piece of evidence for this narcissistic personality trait. This lack of self was also exhibited in the documentary when he moved to Florida. When you see the documentary, this is after the trials and when he is no longer a loved celebrity in the way that he was before, he gets a whole new group of friends and he, he's in Florida. And he suddenly now is like, like a pseudo gangster in a sense. You just have to see the documentary. It's, it's just, uh, I don't know how to see it, but it's very funny to see this very previously clean cut guy in Brentwood. Now he's in Florida and he's dressed up like a gangster and he goes to strip clubs and he allows himself to be filmed with girls, you know, all these girls grinding up against him and he's drinking all the time and he's using substances all the time. And he, he's talking about his crotch all the time. And he's, he's a completely different person, but you can tell, at least in my view of it, that he's acting like a gangster. He doesn't, he doesn't, well, I guess we all act like our roles in life, but he just seems like he's putting on a show to get attention and he doesn't he doesn't have an internal sense of who he is because of this attachment and security and because of those early narcissistic injuries as as a child and so he, he when he goes to florida he he he's like well how how do i get attention now and he just creates a whole new persona and thinks you know i'm going to get attention this way now Another element that they talk about in the documentary that points towards narcissism is his ability to get people to like him. When you define yourself through other people's eyes and you need accolades and you need people to like you, you become very good at noticing how other people come to like you and you become quite obsessed with learning those skills. Now, it's not necessarily a conscious effort, but, you know, imagine you lack of self and you, and you lack self-esteem and you interact as you grow up and you find that when you act in a particular way, suddenly you feel relaxed, you feel better, you don't necessarily know why. Well, the possibility is, is, is it's because you have a bunch of people around you now telling you how great you are and you learn what got you there. And you become very good at that. And there's a lot of documentary footage and interviews of how good he was at getting people to like him. There's this one just chilling interview where he's on this radio show and this, they, it's on, it's filmed as well. And the woman that, who's interviewing him on the radio starts off by having a pretty bad attitude towards OJ. She's like, well, OJ, you know, I don't know what to think about you. Uh, you're on the show right now. And, y you know, she's coming from that position of you're a terrible human being who murdered people and lied about it and got away with it. And I do not like you. But by the end of the interview, she's saying things like, gosh, darn it, OJ, you've, you, I don't know. I just like you. And I, I just want to invite you to a party. And, and, he, and you, you just see how good he is at just being likable, even though he did some terrible, terrible things. Well, this is, this is, in my view, evidence of this attachment, insecurity, and also this narcissism. When you need other people to like you in order to feel secure, you become very good at being able to, to manage that. And there was evidence that he was good at this at a very young age. They, they tell the story about how he stole his best friend's girlfriend. I think, he, I think that was a woman he married in high school. And soon afterwards, that friend was, uh, was, was fine with it. <laughs> you know, it was, it was they, they talk about how you've been OJ'd, they would say is you would start off being very upset at OJ and then somehow OJ would just charm you back into good graces with him. So again, when you are desperate for uh, the attention from other people 
and that is your sole way of having attachment security in the world, you become very good at getting people to like you. Another element of narcissism that, I don't know, is a little dubious, but I'll point it out, is that when he figures out right after the murders, he's thinking, crap, I'm caught. Instead of just, I don't know, going in the backyard and thinking about shooting himself in the back shed or something, he gets in the Bronco and then gets the entire world to watch him as he's driving. He's in the back seat, but his friend's driving. He was completely comfortable in that situation. <laughs> you know, he, he didn't mind apparently all that media attention. And again, it's a little dubious because he was in, you know, a very difficult emotional spot at that point. And in my estimation was, you know, seriously suicidal in that moment. But it is just, it's interesting how narcissistic his suicide, his suicidal gesture was. You know, there, there are many different ways that people will gesture suicide, and some are more noticeable than others, and his was very noticeable, you know? Another narcissistic element that you see in both the FX miniseries and the uh, ESPN documentary is that after he did all these crimes to Nicole, I mean, cause you know, he killed her, but he also beat her several times. He it's, it's very narcissistic to believe that you're going to get away with it. It's very narcissistic to believe that the police will side with you. It's narcissistic to believe that you're entitled to doing these things and, and entitled to getting away with it. The problem is, is the police actually, to some extent, perpetuated that notion for him and fed into his narcissism by letting him get away with it. But it's just another element of narcissism that I saw. It's also a common presentation for narcissistic people to be extremely well-liked by people around them and to be extremely disliked by people close to them. This is a, a presentation I've seen many times before in that the community thinks that this person is just the wonderful guy, you know, man, just he, they'll, they won't just think he's a good guy. They'll think he's the best guy. But then at home, this guy is terribly abusive to his family. This is a, is a common presentation of someone with narcissistic personality. And so OJ fit that bill, right? Everyone loved him. They they didn't just think he was a great, you know, he's, ah, he's a good guy. They thought he was a great guy. They thought he was an amazing guy. And then he goes home and look at the way that he treated Nicole, just repeatedly beating her to the point where she's terrified for her life and hiding in the bushes and calling the cops. Also, he seemed to lack a an ability to figure out what other people would do. When you're narcissistic, you are naturally very focused on the way you see the world. And so it he, you know there's a lot of evidence where he clearly didn't understand or he couldn't predict how other people were going to react. Like during the trial and right after the trial, he just wanted his life to go back to normal and he wanted to go back into the limelight. But any other person in my guess would be like my career is over and my life is over. This 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 trial has ruined my life. C certainly there are some people that love me even more now and and want me to succeed, but there's a whole section of this country that that hates me and thinks that I'm a murderer. And so you know, because you know, if he wasn't narcissistic, he'd be able to put himself in these other people's shoes and say like, look, my celebrity status is is different now at the very least and I need to make decisions based on that. He made decisions as if he was going to go right back to the way he was. He made decisions that seemingly suggest that everything was fine and that his celebrity status would just continue. And so this is another element of narcissism. It's sort of a, a massive blind spot to what other people are experiencing in relation to you. It's you know, because you're, you're developmentally 
sort of arrested at a very young age. You know, three-year-olds don't have as good ability as 25-year-olds when it comes to predicting what other people feel and think. The ability to reach out into someone else's heart and mind and say, this is how that person is feeling. That's something that you develop as you age. And if you're arrested at an earlier age regarding, you know, attachment wounds uh, that result in you being narcissistic and only focused on yourself, then it makes it difficult for you to know what other people are going to do because you're only seeing things through your eyes. He wanted to be a celebrity, but he didn't have the ability to put himself in other people's shoes and say, like, they're not likely to receive me in a good light post this this thing. And so there's just lots of evidence of him not being able to to figure out how other people would be thinking. Okay, so in conclusion, here is what I will say. Clearly, I think that he had at least a dash of narcissism. But really, the main thing was he, he had a, a moderate to severe attachment injury that he suffered from from an early age, perhaps very early in his life, that arrested him in a very narcissistic stage of his personality. So he began life with this attachment wound and this narcissistic coping mechanism, shall we say, and this arrested development in the narcissistic phase of life. Then you give this man tremendous fame and privilege. You just give him all this fame and the privilege of money and celebrity status. And then you also put in a pinch of, say, average IQ issues and lack of decision-making skills. You also put in there an inner conflict regarding racism and being lesser than others. And uh, you also put in there that as a young child, he had rickets and felt left out of the world and felt lesser than other people because his legs were disabled. And again, all based on this insecure attachment and this arrested development in the narcissistic phase of life, he, it, it drove him to get love from other people and to get attention from other people. And he was good at that for a long period of time. And then he truly falls in love with Nicole. And he starts to really have feelings for her in a way that perhaps he's never had feelings for anyone else. There's evidence of that, that he, when you watch the documentary, you actually see, because there's friends and family talking about their relationship, the, they, they characterize the two of them as lovebirds. You know, they were just really in love with each other. So here is, here's OJ. For the first time in his life, he has someone that's loving him back and paying attention to him. It's not just celebrity. It's, it's his wife. It's someone that loves him for who he is behind the scenes. And he starts to open up. And he starts to heal from that attachment problem. But he still has this issue, still attachment injured, still narcissistic. And occasionally they get in fights and he loses it. And she starts to wonder if this is such a great relationship. And she starts to cope with that by trying to pull away from him. But she has her own attachment issues to go with it. And so she comes back and, and they do this for a while. And he starts to be extremely hurt by Nicole pulling away. It's just yet another example of someone leaving him and someone abandoning him. And he becomes extremely hurt by that. And he turns to his narcissistic coping mechanism. I'm OJ. No one does that to me. I need to put an end to that. I get away with things. The cops are on my side. I'm the juice. I can run away from anything. I can charm the socks off of anybody. I can do anything I want. And how can I, how can I end this pain? Well, 
one way to end it is to kill her because she won't leave me if she's dead. She can't be with anyone else if she's dead. She can't be with my friends and have sex with Marcus Allen and these other people if she's dead. And then I will be a, a widower and people will, will feel bad for me if she's dead. I can solve all my problems if she's dead. And so I'm going to kill her. And that'll solve my problems. She won't leave me anymore. And this pain will end. Of course, the pain would not end, but that's the fantasy. The pain will end if she's dead. And so in an act of desperation, he goes out to her house and had probably contemplated it before and kills her in a in a in a rage of desperation he doesn't cover his tracks because he's not thinking straight it wasn't a a thoughtful decision for him it was one out of emotional desperation and then he gets back home and he thinks my god what did i do how do i get away with this well hey i'm oj i'll i'll charm people i'll talk people out of it and then initially that doesn't work but he gets an excellent defense team and they get some a few lucky breaks and Mark Furman and this sort of thing and he gets off. And so then he becomes uh, post, you know, acquittal OJ. People are not treating him the same way as they used to. He becomes desperate again. He changes his personality to a gangster. He surrounds himself with more yes men and he tries to get people to love him this way it's still not working he again gets desperate and commits this impulsive act of of you know a minor petty crime then he goes to jail and now he's truly alone and he feels truly empty and my guess is is he does think about suicide. He's about to come up for the potential of being paroled soon. And he's about to come out. Uh, and my, many people think that they will parole him, you know, because he, the, the crime that he was convicted of did not deserve 33 years, according to many uh, experts. And so the parole board will, will, you know, have an opportunity to, to sort of, uh, correct for that. Now, will the parole board be like, no, he's not getting out. That's OJ Simpson. He killed those two people and he needs to be in jail for a long time. We don't know, but there's a chance that he's going to get out soon. And I'm very curious if he does get out to see what he's going to do. What, what will he do now uh, that he's actually been in jail? What will he do? I, I think that it's, it's an interesting um, conundrum. He could continue to make bad choices and to be aggressive towards other people and entitled and, and all this sort of stuff. But an interesting thing about personality traits is they tend to become less dysfunctional over time as people age. Not all the time, but people who are narcissistic tend to, tend to be less narcissistic later in life. The, so my question is, what if OJ decides that, and if my conceptualization of him is correct, if he's a psychopath, which is possible, then none of this applies. There's just a, a central deficit in his personality that will just never get better. But if he is reacting out of an attachment and security, and he learns, maybe he's in therapy, I don't know, may, and, and he learns how to cope with this, there's a chance, I think, after really trying to figure this guy out, I think there's a chance that he will come out and he will admit everything and he will talk about what I'm telling and he will provide a, a backstory for this and he will lay it all out. And he, there's a chance that he will do that. I, th I think given my conceptualization of him and given his path in life and how, how low he has been laid, I think that there's a chance he's just be like, you know what? The, the game, the, the, the gig is up <laughs> and 
Is that the phrase? I don't know. Jig is up. Anyway, some sort of phrase like that where it's over. I can't trick people anymore. Maybe if I just came clean, maybe, because I think there's a part of him that wants to, that wants to come clean. Because again, he's not, in my estimation, a psychopath. He does have empathy and he probably does feel really bad about what he did to Nicole and Ronald Goldman. He doesn't exhibit that publicly, of course, but I think that there's a, there's a chance that he, that he really does deep down feel remorse for that. Again, unknown. He could be a psychopath. I don't know. Maybe he has an elaborate sense of denial. I don't know. But I think that there's a chance that, that he could, that he could um, level with everybody in his OJ way. Try to, try to make do with what he has and try to come clean. I don't know. We'll see. And, and I also wonder, is he watching these documentaries? Is he watching the miniseries? My guess is, is he is. What does he think of it, you know? And does it help him to understand himself better? If someone made a documentary about you, my guess is, is you'd be like, oh, I'm starting to draw some connections about myself. And I wonder if, if that's helping him to understand himself better and to help him to, to figure out the right thing to do moving forward. But anyway... All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. My God, I'm looking at the time code. It is almost three hours. Mackerel. That is it for this episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me out there. And if you haven't already, please become a patron. Become a patron of the podcast. When you become a patron, you get access to all of our premium episodes. Become a patron of the podcast. When you do so, we answer your emails faster. You get special content and you get our love and, and our admiration, please do so. If you want to satisfy my, my narcissistic urges and needs, then you will do that. Bad joke. Too soon. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me. Let me know what you think and take care of yourself because you deserve it. <laughs>